It would appear that a move is being made right now to suppress or even get Rumble banned. The beginning is that advertisers are pulling off of Rumble because Rumble refuses to shut down Russell Brand. Now, most of you are aware, if you, tra- if you track the show over the past week, UK Parliament actually sent letters to various social media networks and television networks effectively demanding that Russell, Russell Brand's deals be yanked or his content get pulled. Now we are seeing big brands like Burger King and HelloFresh pull their ads off of Rumble, sparking calls for another boycott. And I got to be honest, I've been boycotting Burger King for a long time. And it's not political. It's just that their food is trash. So, you know, there's that. We got a bunch of other stories, too. I mean, the crazy news is that U.S. Abrams tanks have arrived in Ukraine. Oh, boy. And now a report from CBS News shows that the U.S. taxpayer is footing the bill for Ukrainian small businesses. That's right. We're not just funding the war. We're funding the lives of your everyday Ukrainian. Hey, man, I like Ukraine. I like Ukrainian people. But I don't know why our tax got, tax dollars are going to paying for their businesses. That makes no sense. Well, this might make sense, I guess. In that context, Canadian Parliament cheered and clapped for an actual Nazi. Yeah. And now they're saying they're all embarrassed. But this is how depraved their cult zealotry and support of Ukraine has become to the point where they will give a standing ovation to a Nazi because he's Ukrainian. That's nuts. We'll talk about that. Plus, Washington Post is quite concerned. Their own poll shows Donald Trump beating Joe Biden by 10 points. Oops. They're saying, no, 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 please. It's just an outlier. Despite the fact that Trump is leading in aggregate across the board in all these different polls. Yeah. We'll get into all that before we get started, my friends. Head over to TimCast.com. Click TimCast IRL X Miami and pick up your tickets while you still can. We're about uh, just about two weeks, week and a half out from our Miami event, October 6th, 6 p.m., 1030 p.m. It's going to be amazing. We've got Patrick, Bet, David, James O'Keefe, Matt Gates. It'll be me, Luke Rukowski, Ian Crossland. We're going to have a bunch of special guests. Alex Stein will be doing an opening set. We've got a pre-show. We've got an after show. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. We hope to see you there. A bunch of free stuff for everybody who attends. And uh, really, pick up your tickets now. We uh, we hope to see you. There's going to be a meet and greet for TimCast.com elite members at 3 p.m. that day. So if you want to be a member, click join us at TimCast.com. Sign up and you'll get access to the Discord server, the TimCast members community hangout, where there is a pre-show. Everyone's talking to each other. An after dark show after we wrap up for the night. All of our members keep the conversation going, and we will host at 10 p.m. an uncensored members-only show that you can come hang out at and even submit questions, potentially call into the show and talk to us and our guests. So go to TimCast.com, sign up. Don't forget to also smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends. Joining us tonight to talk about this and a whole lot more, we got Patriot J. What up, man? Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Who are you? What do you do? Uh, man, I'm a part-time rap artist, criminal defense attorney in Los Angeles, political reporter for Breitbart. I do a little bit of everything here and there. Right on. Well, thanks for hanging out. It's going to be fun. Yes, we also sir. got Andy No. He's in town. Hi, Tim. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. Who are you? What do you do? I am a journalist, a senior editor at The Post Millennial. I'm probably most uh, well-known for my reporting on Antifa. Right on. And uh, recently, there was uh, something happened. We'll, we'll talk about this, too. Uh, a member of the Democratic Party sent a a terroristic threat to shut down one of your events or something like that? Yeah, so I'm in the U.S. on this trip because on on Friday, uh, September 22nd, I um, was uh, invited to speak by the Common Sense Society in Richmond, Virginia, uh, an event put on by the uh, Virginia Council. And uh, it took the third venue for me to actually speak. The first one was the uh, Commonwealth Club, which is a gentleman's club, and they gave in to a cancel campaign by the extremist far left a gentleman's club yes that's right like a strip club no like a social club right (laughs) a social sorry i forgot (laughs) yeah that's the american colloquialism correct uh social club for for okay so um they canceled um shame on them and then the second was the uh a marriott hotel in in richmond and on the day of they canceled and and all all it took for the mini cave was just for uh, these agitators to call in. There was they put out the script with all these lies saying that I was a neo Nazi. This was a neo Nazi event, and armed Nazis was coming, and Marriott Corporate canceled. And um, fortunately, we were able to speak at a community center in the end. And there were about two hundred people who came, and uh, there were a lot of attempts to shut it down. And there was a, a person um, who is uh, a leader in the official Democrat Party group in Richmond. 
uh, Jimmy, Lee, Jimmy Lee Jarvis, who posted um, uh, a picture on social media saying that he was going to the Andy Ngo event, and the picture was of an individual holding up a box of dynamite. Wow. Well, we'll talk about that and a whole lot more. So thanks for hanging out, man. Glad to see that you're okay and the event went off uh, somehow. But uh, we got Hannah Claire hanging out as well. Hey, I'm Hannah Claire Brimlow. I'm a writer for TimCast.com. I'm so excited to be here with this West Coast West Coast contingent. Surge is here too, finally. Yes, I am back. Uh, thanks, Carter, and thanks, Kellen, for taking care of this while I was out. I am excited to meet you guys both. Let's get started, Tim. All right, here's the first story from the New York Post. Burger King faces boycott after yanking ads from Rumble over Russell Brand accusations. There's so much crammed into this headline. <laughs> Russell Brand accusations, Rumble defends it, Burger King boycotts. Man, that's like each of those things are, are big stories just piled on top of each other. They say though Burger King hasn't publicly stated why it recently removed its adverts on the popular site. Just as other brands like ASOS and HelloFresh recently did, social media users have questioned the timing of the move which came just one week after Brand came under fire. The Whopper House has since been bashed for pulling its ads from the self-proclaimed free speech platform before Brand has actually been convicted. Burger King has pulled its ad from Rumble because the free speech platform refuses to play judge, jury, and executioner of Russell Brand after the UK governor demanded the platform demonetize him. UK governor? Who's that? Is that a reference to somebody? I'm not familiar with that position in the UK. I know it was a UK parliament, uh, member of parliament, right? Yeah, I, I think that's probably a typo. It was a member of parliament. Yeah, member of parliament sent a letter out to all these different networks. Reminder, Brand has not been convicted of a single crime. Boycott Burger King. They hate free speech and due process and their food is poison. Anyways, stop eating it. I just want to pause and say, if you've been eating Burger King for any reason, please don't. I think Burger King is just awful, but that's just my opinion. I mean, I'm not going to besmirch the good name of Burger King, I guess. Is this Charlie Kirk saying it's poison? I wonder what the, 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 the legalities on that calling it poison are. I think that's like, I don't know if you can say that, but I guess it's an opinion statement. I think Burger King is unhealthy. And I, I'd be, I, I think it's very, would be very funny if Burger King started suing people for claiming their food is bad for you because it is bad for you. You know, their onion rings. I don't even know what their onion rings are. I got to be honest. I think their onion rings are potatoes. No, for real. Have you ever had Burger King onion rings? Like years ago. I'm pretty sure it's, I, well, in my opinion, it does not taste, it's not an onion. Like it's, it's some kind of mashed something or other. They cut into a ring. Yeah, just not good. Anyway, yeah, here we go. This is the next story we have from The Guardian. Firms pull ads from Rumble platform over Russell Brand videos. So it's Burger King, ASOS, and HelloFresh have removed these ads. And now we're getting people calling for a boycott of these companies. And this is uh, in a public statement posted on the next. Rumble called the letter disturbing because the government came out. So basically, this is where we're at. I think what we're seeing here is actually a move to begin to remove Rumble. In this story from The Sun, they say, I'm an online expert. Russell Brand's refuge platform, Rumble, may be forced offline under new internet safety laws. Rumble may go the uh, parlor route. What do you guys think? I mean, I think Russell Brand is obviously being tr treated completely unfairly. Uh, you know, he doesn't even have a way to defend himself from these allegations because there's it hasn't nothing has been filed in a court of law. So other than um, Rumble support, Rumble saying basically you don't need to leave our platform. He doesn't have a lot of recourse here. Uh, and that's that's a bizarre position to put in. I mean, what is he going to well, do? Well, the question is, well, uh, are they targeting Rumble? Is Are they going to go after Rumble and try and get Rumble taken down? Advertisers pulling off the entirety of the platform because Russell Brand is on it? How does that make sense? I think we need to figure out some sort of way for people to just fund these websites. I, I'm sure they're, I, I'm not familiar with Rumble, but I'm sure that they have subscriptions or things like that. But really, really need to get back to like users funding this because the advertisers have so much power. True, but the advertisers on platforms like YouTube gave birth to the influencer ecosphere. It's a whole generation of media that's really disruptive. I mean, as much as, you know, podcasts and alternative news, really, it's the influencer web that uh, drives these things, which for the most part is predominantly funded by advertisers. It seems unfair that, you know, people looking to have an alternative to YouTube would not be able to participate in standard retail advertising dollars. I mean, not that you should buy everything an influencer sells. On the other hand, uh, there, in addition to unpersoning Russell Brand, there's an attempt to unplatform Rumble itself. I yeah. buy a lot of stuff off Instagram. Mm -hmm. Basically, if Instagram shows it to me, I'm buying it because mm -hmm. <laughs> they because because you know they're they're ripping through my private data. 
and the computer the algorithms know you better than you know, better than you know yourself. Right. And so then you get this ad for like I don't know this this UFO thing. I got an I got an ad on Instagram for it, and I was like, I must buy this. And so I did. And then they added that shop feature to make it easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Creepy. We really need to commend uh, Rumble for not giving in to the pressure campaigns that they're probably feeling from every direction right now. Um, YouTube should be condemned, I think, in the strongest terms for demonetizing <clears throat> Russell Brand based on um, accusations in the media where he has really no recourse or ability to respond other than through the media space. Um, and the BBC has been pressured into removing old content that features brands, so he's losing royalties from there. With that said, I, I, I do want to caveat that I think for all the people that, that came out, have come out immediately in defense of, of, of Mr. Brand, I, I'm, I'm just concerned that the, the backlash against um, Believe All Women is, is becoming now the flip side of Believe No Women. And I, yeah. I actually think that the Sunday Times investigation was very thorough. And I think the allegations are credible. With that said, though, they are anonymous and they're placed entirely in the space of a media PR battle, not uh, through a civil lawsuit and no charges have been filed in the criminal space. So for a man now um, who's having his entire career unravel in a matter of hours, it's this is a, it's a deep injustice and it feels I yeah, yeah I, I, I don't find them credible. I, I you don't I, No, I mean, first. I'll defer to you. I mean, uh, I've only have I only I've I've only read the articles about them, right? But my issue is if Russell Brand has a relationship with someone. And no, 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 not even Russell Brand. If a man and a woman have a relationship and they argue with each other and they fight, you can say that you know, twenty years later, oh look, here's here's text messages showing them fighting. Him saying, "Will you apologize? I know I acted poorly last night." And the assu the assumptions you can make based off uh, of of a 20 year old story. So this, there's a text message between Russell and this woman. The reason why I view this stuff as I, I don't know, I don't know, uh, uh, not worthy of news in my opinion is for one, the media absolutely loved everything he was doing all, all that time ago. People change, whatever. If the argument is he shouldn't do this, well, he's not doing it now. Okay, so it's been 20 years. The issue I have is. Let's say you, Andy, got into a fight with someone and you texted them saying it was really inappropriate what you did last night. I demand an apology. I can't believe you would do that to me. And what happened? He stiffed you on a bill at a bar. And then it says like, look, when I tell you this is how it's going down, you can't you can't do this to me. I am furious. And it's, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And then later, 20 years, you're like, oh, that text, uh, that was rape. And it's like, no, 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 wait, hold on. That text was about something totally different. It's 20 years later. What do you do? The problem I have with these accusations 20 years on is that. You can take a legitimate relationship and then just say 20 years later, oh, that was not consensual. What? How do you even prove that? I'm not I'm not saying like there, there are challenges in the law. But the weirdest thing about how the, how the law is handled today is that when it comes to murder, there are cold cases where there's a person who's been suspected of the murder. And we're like, what do we do? And then people are just like, I don't know. I think he might be the murderer, but we really don't know. But then when it comes to issues like this, it's like destroy his life entirely because of anonymous accusations there's, the, the, the police are just now opening investigation. So I suppose my point is it is almost impossible for accusations this this far, this this old to be credible. I don't know what you do to make them credible. That being said, they there can be new evidence. I'm sure things can emerge where there's like a video Russell made of himself where he's like, I can't believe that I actually did that to those women last night. It's true, blah, blah, blah. And it's from 20 years ago. And you're like, oh, wow, there's evidence. Evidence exists for the time being. They've only just started an investigation. So it's like, sure, man, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it credible. And actually, I would, I would, uh, at this point, I agree with you when you say it shouldn't be believe no women. It's true. But we're talking about believe all women is supposed to be a woman goes to the police the next day or maybe within a week. And, you know, she's traumatized. She doesn't know what to do. And then she makes an accusation. We say, okay, we will believe we will operate under the assumption the accusation is true and correct and investigate. It's not supposed to be that 20 years later, someone comes out to the to the news and the press and says, oh, that famous celebrity. Yeah, he did a bad thing to me. And then advertisers pull ads off a platform because he's on that platform. None of this makes sense. Why would the UK government try to get Russell Brand banned? That makes no sense. That makes the claims. Uh, it, it strikes their credibility outright. Like, f for sure, you can make the argument that the, the, the member of parliament was just exploiting a crisis situation for political gain. 
but it, it just I just don't see it. Um. Well, I I think the actions of these third parties who are now uh, politicians, um, activist groups, online activists, I think their actions shouldn't necessarily um, affect the credibility of those who have come forward. Um, these are third parties that have their own ulterior motives. That the the MP will have her own reasons to try to elevate her name and profile in the press through these type of actions, as well as other individuals who have um, placed pressure to try to uh, destroy um, the career of Russell Brand. It's just, I think, um, uh, you know, I've been through, um, I, I've been the, the victim in, um, or I, I've, uh, I've been the... <laughs> through a trial, a criminal trial, where I was a, a witness who testified uh, and made allegations in, in a criminal matter before. And that process, I think, has... It helped me understand, potentially, why some victims don't go forward. Uh, the process of um, being cross-examined and gaslit and reliving over and over a really traumatic experience is... It, it really destroys you. and that then kind of opened my eyes to why I kind of understand why some women, for the first time, it made me understand perhaps why some people don't immediately go to law enforcement. However, th that that doesn't mean that I support them that decades later, years later, then they go anonymously to the press. Yeah, I, I got to be honest, I don't care. I, I'm, I, I don't play to this emotional argument of, oh, it's so hard and it's so emotional. It, you know, it was very difficult for people to do this. They say, oh, victims have a hard time. That sucks. Sorry, have a nice day. The justice system is not supposed to be your feelings are hurt, so we're going to destroy a man's life over it. The justice system is, yes, we recognize there are hardships. We want to, to seek the best outcomes for justice. That means if there is a guy who is abusing women in large numbers, then definitely we're going to try and solve for that problem. However, if you as the victim are unable to provide evidence and testimony in a meaningful manner, in, with, with in 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 a time appropriate manner, then that's it. The legal system is not supposed to be bent because some people have hurt feelings. I, I will. I, I do not accept that. It, I mean, that's the UK. I can't speak for London. I can say for the United States. I absolutely reject the idea that we would have to put someone's freedom and liberty at risk to protect the feelings of another person because oh they felt bad. Sorry. You need to have evidence. It needs to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And what we're seeing now is in line with so many other BS moments throughout the past couple of decades uh, or a decade or so where people have been falsely accused and uh, Julian Assange, a great example, the media lied about everything. They use it to destroy his life. They didn't they didn't just fire him. They locked him up and they have him locked up to this day, despite the fact we know the accusations that were made were completely untrue. So when you get a Jeffrey Epstein who gets away with it and gets protection from the media and the press, and then later it's like, whoops, all of that was true. Forgive me if I don't believe you when you go after a Julian Assange and you, you're, you're ignoring the people on your side and you're targeting the people who are not on your side. All, all, all I see right here is when, when multiple agencies pull off rumble, that's, that, that, that the Occam's razor suggests a coordinated effort to do so. When Alex Jones got banned, and I think it was, was it 2018 or was it 2019? 2018? 2018. 2018. All the networks did it at the same time. There's an argument to be made that they were just waiting for, uh, you know, one, you know, Twitter's like, as soon as any other company makes a move, we'll do it too. Or you likely have a scenario where there was some political agenda. In the instance of Alex Jones, we don't know definitively, but in the instance of Russell Brand, we know for a fact. The UK government solicited networks and, and platforms to remove Russell Brand. So why are these ads now being pulled from Rumble? Likely because the same people in the UK government are now targeting anybody who's sponsoring Rumble. I don't think it's as simple as to say a couple activists called Bur uh, Burger King and said, oh, you know, you guys are running ads on Rumble. No, it's more like a national security get letter gets sent out saying you will do this now or else. Or maybe they don't need it. Maybe a member of parliament contacts your, your head of legal office with a shakedown letter and Burger King's like, listen, we do not need Rumble. 44 million users. It's not worth a permitting headache with the UK, UK government. We're generating hundreds of millions of dollars out of the UK. Let's just 
let it go. I don't know. Is Burger King in the UK? They're in the UK, right? In the UK. I don't think they make that much money. But that's that, that's my point. If if right now it's come to the point where you have four women who, for whatever reason, did not, you know, come out with these allegations, and it's now twenty plus years later, ten or twenty years later, I'm just like, you know, prove it. That that's all that matters, right? You need proof. Do you have a take as a criminal defense attorney? Yeah, I mean, Tim's right. You need proof. You have to meet a certain burden of proof. Uh, it's really hard to believe women 20 years after the fact. So uh, these situations do occur. I would encourage individuals who are victims to report it as soon as possible rather than waiting decades down the line. And you notice it always happens when they're in the spotlight for something or when they're leaning on the right side because it None of these allegations were ever brought when Russell Brand was like a darling of the corporate media. He was totally fine. Nobody said anything. Now he's more independent. Now you see them trying to come after him. And it just seems very coordinated. Right. Well, why, they didn't, why, why they didn't the say anything care? when he made, married Katy Perry. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah. Why, why does the media care? How come the media did not care about Epstein? In fact, they covered up for him, but they care so much about Russell Brand. I don't buy it. Not for one second. They all of a sudden care about Russell Brand. They all of a sudden need to have the ads pulled. They all of a sudden are realizing his shows have to get pulled off the BBC Channel 4 and YouTube or whatever. What? I don't buy it. Sorry. Have a nice day. Ep Epstein, they knew. Ep Epstein had been charged. And I think it was like in the 2000s. They knew what he was doing. He got a sweetheart deal and was let go. So, so where was the media on this one? Now, you can argue that Epstein was blackmailing powerful individuals. Okay. Where was the media? Because this expose and Russell Brand is the Sunday Times, it's Channel 4. All of a sudden, one day, somebody at these networks, they're just like, you know, I'm really concerned about Russell Brand. I'm going to go dig around for 20-year-old accusations. What? Someone started, so you, you don't understand this. Someone started, some journalist decided to start soliciting past relationships of Russell Brand to, to, and ask them about issues of impropriety. Why? No, I mean, for real, look, if he was doing these things, that's bad for sure. But it's a weird thing for the media to immediately want to pick up, especially when it's coming from from corporate narrative establishment government media sources, quite literally. So it seems weird. And he's in an impossible position because there's nothing going on in court. Right. So he could file, let's say, a defamation suit, maybe against these anonymous people. But then he is adding to this narrative that he is the aggressor. Right. He's going after these theoretical victims who aren't even being named and therefore he's trying to get lots of money out of them. Like it, there's no good look for him in this scenario. I get what you're saying. I think I think I agree. I think it is complicated for a lot of people to decide to go through the trial process. I don't think cross examination is easy. Uh, but the fact that this was solicited from a reporter is so strange. Yeah, I mean what what Me Too I think has done is it's an, it's giving ex an excuse it's in many ways actually discourage victims to um to speak out whenever when they want and to who they want like the media rather than to law enforcement i think law enforcement in, uh, in reporting is so key for victims to get justice when you i mean when you wait so many years and statutes of limitations pass your memories is blurry evidence is lost and destroyed it's just uh, yeah the me too has been more about i think um giving space for people to tell these stories where they can actually never be falsifiable mm -hmm. and that's you know there's and in that case you can never even wait for a due process to play out i see a lot of people responding like centrist response on social media we should uh withdraw withhold judgment and wait for just uh this process to play out but there is no, no process, process playing out so it's um you know, so, right. so I, I have I, criticisms, on, you know, going well, I, so many I, directions here. I reject all of the uh, accusations and allegations against Russell Brand. I, right. I mean, it's 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 a pattern in. But in, one of them went to a rape crisis center at yeah, the time. And and considering the political state of this country, considering the actions being taken against them, considering the motivations of the press. Sure. But I won't give the benefit of the doubt. Sorry. Not happening. It's just there. there there's there. It, it's. There are so many bad people and criminals who are getting away with everything that what we end up seeing is law enforcement choose to go after certain people when it benefits them politically. That's the nature of the West today. So when I see 20 year old accusations, it's Brett Kavanaugh all over again. 
Sorry, don't care at all. You want to investigate, you want to prove it, by all means, please do so. You prove it in a court, fine, I get it. But now, does anyone actually even believe these courts? You got Donald Trump and that story of that woman in New York that he went to that department store. Which Carol E. Jean. Yeah, right. What was mm-hmm. the department store? Uh, Bergdorf Goodman's, right? Yeah, yes. Bergdorf Goodman's. And it's the busiest place with the most famous man, arguably, in the city. Nobody he saw owns him. the hotel next door. He owns the hotel next door. <laughs> Nobody noticed Donald Trump with no security yep. going to the second floor, I think it was. And and then and then a New York jury finds Donald Trump accountable, liable for for th- this uh, this assault or something. Sexual assault. Yeah, that's insane. That's insane. So by so sure, fine. Still don't care. I don't care. I the, think the, the silver the weaponization lining, of it is just so so thick and so intense. I'm giving no one the benefit of the doubt. I think the silver lining from the Russell Brand story is that people who care about free speech and due process are actually standing up and they're boycotting these companies who are pulling uh, pulling funds from Rumble advertising. I think it's really good to see the conservative boycotts that have been happening all year. Uh, it, it finally feels like we're trying to make our voices heard. Yeah. Yeah. See, the issue is every single time something happens. Or I shouldn't say every single time, but uh, typically there have been major political moments over the past several years and you get conservatives, libertarians and post liberals all trying to do the reasonable thing. OK, like you said, oh, we'll hear this one out. And what happens? Bunk turns out to be nonsense. I remember uh, when George Floyd, the George Floyd video came out and we all were like, yeah, that video is bad. Like that should not have gone down that way. And then you you get the body camera footage and learn a lot more about what was really happening. And now you're like, okay, so it's it's tragic, but it's a bit different than the way they put it. The original video of George Floyd is a guy being uh, he's on the ground and they're kneeling on his neck and he dies. And it's like, whoa. Then you learn the dude was chewing a speedball behind the wheel of a car. The police brought him out. Floyd demanded, begged and screamed to get me out of the car and put me on the ground. He had a a cocktail of, of drugs in his system still. He should have been given proper medical treatment, you know, but it's nowhere near what actually went down. Ahmed Arbery is the most egregious. The people who I, I know conservatives who still don't know the, the, the real story of what happened with Ahmed Arbery and the McMichaels. And we've had people on this show come on and be like, well, the Ahmed Arbery thing, that was justice. I'm like, are you kidding? Did you even watch that? I'm sick of this. Russell Brand in in the corporate press and in the movies is celebrated. Oh, this woman went to the police. I'm glad she did. If there's evidence that comes out, so be it. Then Russell Brand should go to prison if it's true. But not the, police, the rape crisis hunter. Okay, well then I don't believe it. Sorry, like I, you need evidence to, to to convict somebody. You know, I'll, I'll, there's a lot of things people can do, and there's a lot of fake things people do. But my point ultimately, I, we we have spent all, all of our time giving the benefit of the doubt to to so many different people who are evil. At this point, I'm just like, you know, I don't know. Maybe it was 20 years ago. You prove it. We have a story. If not, I, I think it's it's being used to uh, target Rumble. It's being used to stop Russell Brand from producing high profile, high traffic, anti-establishment media. And, not, and, and they're pushing a conspiracy theory that the only reason Russell Brand actually opposes the establishment is because he was trying to build up a base to protect him from accusations against him. It's, it's, it's psychotic. Total BS. Sorry, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not buying it. Anyway, I think we've uh, uh, that horse is is been beaten to death, and we're continuing to beat it. But we'll we'll jump to this story because I want to show you the depravity of the establishment. It's from NBC News. Standing ovation for a Ukrainian who fought with Nazis sparks anger and an apology in Canada. I'd like to slow down for you all and just rephrase that headline. NBC News. Uh oh. How about Canadians give standing ovation to you to Nazi? Is that does that does that work for you guys? There you go. Yaroslav Hunka, 98, was recognized by lawmakers shortly after Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky addressed the Canadian Parliament. Why are they celebrating a Nazi? This was very hard for me to understand. They said that they brought him there because he was a Ukrainian and Canadian hero. Canadian and, hero? Because he's living in Canada, so he has <laughs> you know residency there. But then very quickly said, oh, we actually forgot to do a background check and look him up, which if you compare this to the State of the Union, anytime they're like, and tonight with us is Andy No, a journalist, like someone has vetted this person. Surely that's why they are. They didn't just walk into the chamber and happen to take a seat. Right. Like the idea that this person was not researched beforehand either shows that 
the entire Canadian government needs to consider restaffing or that they were aware of this but didn't understand the implications of... Well, they don't care. I think Canada does care. I think they are just uh, not aware of any sort of form of history. I think they are Nazis. You think all of Canada is Nazis? No, I think I think the people like Trudeau, mm -hmm. they, they, they are Nazis. They, they learn to, to masquerade and shield their eugenicist, racist policies and cheer for Nazis. So the big irony here is that the um, the Speaker of the House of Commons uh, uh, in the Canadian Parliament, so he's with the, the Liberal Party, that's Trudeau's party, uh, invited him and uh, the, the the Nazi war veteran. And apparently all, all they had to hear was that he he served on a unit that, that fought the USS, USSR, but didn't ask for their will on fighting against them on behalf of who well fighting on behalf of the nazis it was an ss uh unit and um it's i mean it's, you know i guess people should remember that just uh, a year and a half ago the january 2022 when the canadian convoy protests were happening uh, the Liberal government, Trudeau, condemned them and said that they were using Nazi symbolism and Nazi imagery and racism. And here they are um, now, um, Prime Minister Trudeau next to President Zelensky and the entire parliament giving a stand standing ovation to not just an accused Nazi or someone who's accused of being far right, but an actual Nazi veteran. Yeah. He was a uh, uh, um, he served in the 14th Waffen Grenadier Division of the SS, a Nazi military unit whose crimes against humanity during the Holocaust are well documented. Well, there you go, Canada. I think it's because they, they have no understanding of, of history, right? Right now, Russia is the big enemy. And so anyone who fought against Russia seems good. But they have very little understanding of actual World War II history. So they don't understand that. Well, they do. I, I, I'm not I'm not willing to rule out that they do, but I just think a lot of it is someone said, oh, this would be a great viral moment where we stand up for this. And they had no idea because they're just not well versed. OK, well, you know, I'm not going to give them the benefit of the doubt here. Let's let's we'll, we'll do this. OK, so they're in Canada. What can I say? It's Canadian, right? Well, let's talk about here in the United States is the political uh, what, what what political faction is aligned with the uh, with the Canadian government, the United States, right? It's progressives, right? I'm not trying to it's not a trick question. In the United States, Trudeau is would be a progressive. He would be aligned with the left and leftists to a great degree. Okay, um, are leftists anti-Semitic? Yes, there's not. That's not a question. Yeah. You look at Black Lives Matter and their support, uh, or, or I should say, many of these prominent celebrities who su who supported Black Lives Matter and also support Farrakhan and the things he said. Unsurprising. You look at the article from Tablet Magazine about. When they went to the Women's March, the, the organizers, and were pushing anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, unsurprising. I just got to be honest. I would not be surprised if eugenicist anti-Semites who share political views happen to cheer for a Nazi. I mean, is that surprising to anybody? No, no. You're like, okay, no. so they're eugenicists. They want racial segregation. They, uh, uh, I, like, what, 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 what more are we supposed to argue here? That they, they use a different word for whatever it is there. Okay, fine. I don't care. Call them whatever you want. They're the same thing. It's so funny to me that in a society where everything is racist or anti-Semitic, everybody uh, can get accused of this except for people who are aligned with supporting Ukraine, including the actual soldiers themselves. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, Russia goes the other direction. They try and claim that everything happening is denazification. And I'm like, that's stupid, too. Like, Russia is not invading Ukraine because there's Nazis there. Because you, they, they want access to Crimea. But you know Russia's now clipping this thing of Zelensky being there, <laughs> plotting the, the actual uh, affiliated Nazi and being like, see, we told you we're here for denazification. It's also, the story has also become a, a big scandal in Poland because that particular unit that that, um, that elderly man uh, was part of was involved in a lot of a slaughtering of a lot of Poles. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, but Canada. they didn't know. They didn't vet him. It's an accident. <laughs> That's the stupidest lie I've ever heard. Yeah. I just get like, how could you even pass that off? I mean, it's ridiculous. I can't say whether or not they're all anti-Semitic and eugenicists, but they're definitely stupid. Well, it's, uh, as, as I often say, it's the banality of evil or it's malicious evil. 
How many of them are actually maliciously anti-Semitic eugenicists? And eh, probably a few, but they're smart enough to get a bunch of morons to clap and cheer for a Nazi. So all you need to understand about how stupid these people are and how dangerous they are is that they don't know or care who they are clapping and cheering for. Mm -hmm. It's like when Joe Biden said, Trina not a shot of pressure, and the crowd goes, yay, and they're all clapping and cheering, and you're like, this is crazy. But Joe Biden goes on stage and says, bad calf care, and everyone's just clapping and cheering. <laughs> they don't know what he said. Mm -hmm. uh, they just know they're supposed to clap, and so they right. did. Yeah. It's frustrating to me that um, often quite uh, educated people are so, so they're, they're very good at recognizing propaganda from Russia and good for them for that and calling it out. But the propaganda that is coming out from Ukraine, it's like they just, there's no scrutiny of any of it. And there's so much propaganda, this whole, uh, you know, this well, one turning a blind eye to the contemporary connections to Nazi organizing in Ukraine. That's completely now no longer an issue to liberals around the world. Um, and then Ukraine now being reframed as this uh, bastion of liberal and progressive values when th it's th that's not the reality of what the what that country is, and nor nor their society. No, I think it's all political theater. I think so much of this is just people not willing to question Ukraine in any any uh, instance at all. And so you can't call it any propaganda because you're not allowed to doubt Ukraine's motives in anything. You're not even allowed to have any kind of doubt. You're supposed to submit entirely to supporting Ukraine and never question any of it. I mean, look how much money we have shipped over to Ukraine. Why? Because we're just supposed to. And those who do speak out are, are then smeared as uh, somehow fans of Russia or fans of um, uh, Putin. I mean, yeah, the, the smear tactics just causes people to become fearful. Mm hmm. And I think so much of it is just a lack of understanding of geopolitical history, right? They have no idea what the ties are. You know, they don't know what happened in Crimea. There's, they don't know what to say. They just know right now it's good to have your blue and yellow flag out and to agree with whatever Biden says and therefore whatever Zelensky says. Yes. They want a simple story of villains and heroes. Who's a good guy, good guy and who's a bad guy. Mm -hmm. And then it leads them to do stupid mistakes. I think it was a genuine mistake like what happened in the Canadian parliament. Oh, uh, a Ukrainian World War II hero veteran. Great. Let's invite him. You know, and they stop looking. Yes. And I think that's also a testament to the, the shortened attention span. I mean, I assume whoever vetted him is fairly young, working at, in a staff position for this elected official. And they think, oh, yeah, I read most of that headline and I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't think it matters. I don't, I don't think it matters at all that uh, whether it's a mistake or not. That's just it's at, at this point in the culture war. In this point in the war with with uh, with Russia and Eastern Europe, all that matters is what they do. If we sit around saying like, well, you know, that was a mistake every single time they scream and cheer for Nazis. It's like, OK, you're going to you're going to be you're going to be giving the benefit of the doubt as uh, of to them the entire way. It's like we're sitting in a car with these people and they're driving full speed, pedal to the metal, foot to the floor, right towards a cliff. And we're like, well, but hold on a minute. They're probably going to turn right they're not going to drive off the cliff. <laughs> they wouldn't do that. And then every single time it's. <laughs> so at this point, I'm just like, I don't care what what they thought they were doing. This is what they do. It's who they are. That's it. So all I got, all I can say is, yes, Canadian Parliament gave a standing ovation to a Nazi. Yeah, but as I said, I don't care why they did it. They did it. You tr Ukraine has become so good at playing the West like a fiddle. Like they're, you know, one of their spokespersons now is this transgender American. Not anymore, though. Oh, that changed? I think they got rid of that person because of. Uh, the the trans spokesperson threatened to kill anyone, you know, or so, something like that. Was that what happened? I can look it up, but I'm there's not like sure. a video where okay. the well, either was or until very recently, this transgender American spokesperson for Ukrainian military who doesn't even speak Ukrainian. Um, obviously, that's you know playing to the sentiments of the the left in the United States. And then well, Ukraine's when, a colony of the United States. And then when Zelensky went to the UN giving a speech and talking about climate change. Oh, right. But listen, Ukraine is a colony of the United States. That's why an American English speaking leftist is the one talking about what's going on. It doesn't matter who is in Ukraine. NATO and the West don't care. And when you learn that the U.S. has been funding the businesses and everything in Ukraine, might as well consider Ukraine a colony of the United States. Just call it. I, I, I don't care for this, this, this wordplay that we have in modern politics, right? Where it's just like, well, you know, oh, not really. We don't call it that. Are we at war with Russia? Yes. In in all form and function. But is it declared? 
When was the last time the U.S. declared a war against anybody? We just go and do it. So you've got U.S. citizens volunteering with U.S. weapons, with U.S. training, with U.S. Uh, with with U.S. backed artillery and intelligence. And it's like, but it's Ukraine that's at war. Yeah, Russia doesn't think so, because practically it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And this is where we're currently at. Well, let me let me pull up this story here from uh, The New York Times. First, Abrams tanks arrive in Ukraine, Zelensky says. U.S. officials said that an initial batch of 31 M1 Abrams tanks promised to Ukraine by the Biden administration have been delivered months ahead of estimates. And it's not just that. It's also this. 60 Minutes reported just the other day. It was discovered that the U.S. is financing more than weapons in Ukraine. The government is buying seeds, fertilizer for farmers, paying the salaries of 57,000 first responders, and subsidizing small businesses. I call that a colony. Yeah. That's it. Ukraine is a colony of the United States. Oh, just wait. I'll, I'll count down until I get the Russell Brand treatment. Because <laughs> I, think, I think the war machine is the bigger reason why they're going after Russell Brand. Yeah. People think it's, it's big pharma. I disagree. And it's, when, look, I mean, 60 Minutes reports this, so maybe they'll go after, who, 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 who does it? Scott Pelley? Is that who's, who's doing 60 Minutes? I think so. Yeah, maybe they'll go after him. He's going to get accused. That'll be hilarious. But uh, the United States, your tax dollars are not going so that Russia could, to, to fight a war in Russia. Your tax dollars are propping up small businesses in Ukraine. Now mm. ask yourself, why is CBS News reporting this? Ukraine is a colony of the United States, which means we pay for their public, uh, their civilian public infrastructure, first responders. It means we subsidize their small businesses, and it means we cover the cost of defense. That's a, that's an American colony as far as I'm concerned. Or call it NATO, whatever you want. But the U.S. U.S. is what's what's paying for all this. Yeah, I'm surprised that this is actually being reported because I'm sure this has had to been going on for the entire time we've been sending them money. We've sent them, I think, $113 billion. There's no way people genuinely thought that was all going to a war effort. Yeah, I mean, it's funny how they support small businesses when they're in Ukraine, but not in the U.S., you know? <laughs> that's, the, that's, yeah. that, that's the point. I mean, the U.S. is in decay. Mm -hmm. We've got crime running rampant, but geez. Yeah, it's, it's frustrating, isn't it? I mean... And now we're supposed to go to the polls, right? I mean, we were saying people just become crazy during election years, but how could you not when you know that you suffered after everything that happened during COVID, the economic turmoil that small businesses, small communities felt because of this to know that this is how Joe Biden decided to spend your tax dollars. It can't feel like anything but a slap in the face. Worse than that. So how many people lost their businesses? How many people had to shut down their stores and go get a job at Walmart? And then you find out that all of your hard work and the money they took from you is propping up a small business in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. That's more than a slap in the face. That that's sedition. I mean, that that is that is, uh, I, I you know you can argue it's not really treason because tre treason has specific parameters, but it is something for the government to take money and resources from Americans and 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 who are suffering and their businesses are shutting down and send all of that over to Ukraine for what? It's a complete lack of loyalty to the American people of any part of the country. It's an right? occupation of the American people and an extraction of their resources to fund other countries. Yeah. It's like mercantilism in the reverse. We're just giving to the colony. Or we have an occupying political force in the United States that's extracting as much as possible before it implodes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the reasons that I'd love to see a Democratic presidential debate, because I'd love to see Joe Biden, number one, have to talk publicly at all, but also have to answer questions about things like this. Because yeah. so far, as long as the Democratic Party can keep it in the background and, you know, certain fractions of the media will talk about it, certain people will talk about it. But ultimately, the average voter should know, should see the dollar amount of what is being sent abroad and where it is going. Because it's not the story of just we're helping poor Ukraine that's being bullied by Russia. There is a much bigger cost. And ultimately, the Biden administration is going to pretend that that's not happening for as long as possible, as will the Democratic Party as a whole. I think the Republicans need to talk about this in the debate stage as well, because I'm not convinced that if another Republican not named Donald Trump gets in there, they're going to stop funding. I think it would just continue. Yeah, I wouldn't yep. be surprised. I think uh, if it's Vivek, you'll see the funding stop. But Nikki Haley is the inverse. She's oh screaming with blood spraying <laughs> from her mouth that she wants to <laughs> blow up children in foreign countries. I despise that woman, by the way. These people are all warmongers. Mm -hmm. They can't give a rational, reasonable justification for what for what they do, what they want, what they're funding. They just lie. I think was it Nikki Haley who lied and said that uh, Putin said Poland's next or something like that? Yeah, I think she was a start of that. 
on the, during the during the the lesser known Republican debate, <laughs> something like that. And this and 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 you've got anti-war left and right being like, what is wrong with these people? Their 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 brains are not right. There is something wrong. You want to make an argument for intervention in war? You can make the argument. You can talk about Russia aligning with China. The U.S. is trying to defend Ukraine and stop Russia from gaining more resources in Eastern Europe and expanding their economic stranglehold in the region as they team up with Russia. It creates a very big threat to so the U.S. trying to push back. I know all that stuff. I've heard all the arguments, but that's not the arguments they make. So long as they want to keep lying about what they're doing, then so be it. They deserve to lose. Yeah. But will they actually? Lose? I mean, yeah. They've lost. Yeah. They, we had that one report, uh, Adrian Norman wrote for TimCast.com. Uh, well, it, it, and to be fair, it was a, it was um, was it Seymour Hirsch, I think. I think so. It was a report from him that he was speaking with an intelligence official. So Seymour Hirsch reported an intelligence official said, oh, it's over. Russia won. <laughs> what did Russia want? They wanted the land bridge into Crimea. They got it. Now what? Now they defend it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. it. So what, 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 what are we doing there? Trying to stop them? If, if the U.S.'s goal really here is to just strip Russia, Russia's access to Crimea and the Mediterranean, then it's basically just the U.S. declaring war on Russia. Yeah. yeah. There's no end in sight, which also aids the Biden administration because continues to send, send, send money over. I mean, yeah. there is nothing in this for the American people. And so I don't understand why we continue it. It costs them every single day and Russia already has its main objective. It doesn't seem like a productive war, but we're going to be there uh, for as long as a Democrat is in office and probably a lot of Republicans too. Um, a productive war, yeah. I think like the last one that we were in. Yeah, yeah that one? so many productive wars in history. But again, like, at a certain point, I mean, the U.S. and the EU could say we're going to broker a deal. Isn't this what Donald Trump said? He said, day one, I'm mm -hmm. going to stop this war. That would be the first yeah. thing I did. The war would stop exactly where it is. Exactly. Wh and Russia would say, OK. Why is no one else doing that? Right. Like, why do we have to keep doing this? I'm asking such deep questions tonight on TimCast <laughs> IRL. I'm stunning all of our guests. <laughs> I mean, do you guys know anyone who's like, yes, this is a great idea. Let us continue to send money to Ukraine. Not at all. No. Well, I think among Democrats, it's still quite a, a popular position. And certainly in in uh, in the EU and in UK, that remains a really popular position. But why? What What is their objective other than we just don't like Russia? Well, there's this whole apparatus in the media that does put out the, the propaganda talking points from Ukraine. Uh, about this being more than just a war between two nations. It's a bit war between good and evil. And it, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's packaged in a way that's simple for the masses, and it, and it works. There's a good side and a bad and side. And it's popular uh, among Democrats in the U.S. and uh, liberal voters in Canada and um, liberal people in, in Europe. But is it enough to outweigh the economic hardship that people in the U.S. are facing. I mean, we were just talking about gas prices in L.A. are crazy. If Ridiculous. you heard this is your cost of living, but also we're still going to continue to fund this war abroad, it would be impossible, at least in my opinion, for anyone who's reasonable to say that's a good use of our tax dollars. I appreciate this. I think it's just a lot of people aren't really paying attention to it. They just think it's something that's going on and that um, that we're kind of supporting it and it's the current thing. But people, when you present the facts to them, when you say, hey, actually, all this money's going here, they would say, yeah, you know, easily, I, we should stop funding. But nobody's really presenting it to them. So they're not seeing the alternative. Yeah. Well, it's a nuanced um, issue. And it's, it's difficult, I think, for the masses to comprehend and to come up with an informed position. It's similar to the problems that arise from immigration you know, we know what it does on the labor market, what it does, uh, how it makes housing crisis worse. But people, by and large, in urban areas don't really push back on the policies of sanctuary cities or, or U.S. immigration policy. In fact, in these areas, they're the loudest in saying, you know, well, have them come in. They want the cake and to eat it too, and they don't realize that the balancing of the books actually in the end doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. and you're going to suffer one way or the other. And... Um, I, yeah, you know, I, I mean, this is really the responsibility of the press to present th the truth on these issues to the public, but they, the establishment legacy media um, fails in that because they're captured. Could you think the legacy media would ever go back to having a standard for truth, or do you think it's a lost, lost cause? 
Uh, the journalism programs at the the universities that lead to people going into New York Times and Washington Post and other places, it's all, I mean, these programs have long been captured. I don't, I don't really know how you can, at this point, do much. So uh, what's the future of legacy media, in your opinion? Gosh. Um... I don't know. I think all, I mean, what I would like to see happen is um, uh, independent and conservative media having more support from philanthropists, for one. I mean, it's it's really hard to get independent media well-funded. You know, writers need to be paid, reporters um, need salaries, and it's, it's, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of money to get that type of stuff going. And uh, we just have to build up these different institutions, I, I guess, you know, I mean, it's a cliche what I'm saying, but really it's, it's, it's so important. And I think what causes a lot of um, conservative or independent media to go under is ultimately it's just there's, the funding's not there. Mm -hmm. People want to get their news for free. Everyone hates going to a news link and then you have to log in or you have to pay, pay or something, mm -hmm. you know, but um, that or the experience is filled with a whole bunch of ads and that's not pleasant <laughs> either, but um, it's, Unless yeah. you're Rumble, and then there's no Burger King ads. <laughs> and the left has more than enough patrons, so they will get funding from powerful, prominent individuals who want to prop up the system. They'll pay millions of dollars to websites that can't make a penny. And oh, Soros has funded media as well. Of course, of course. Mm -hmm. And then on the right, you just got the people who want to contribute, sign up, and join, and pay what they can. That's about it. Yeah. But I think there's been enough stress on the system that more and more people are waking up and starting to join these subscription programs and make contributions. And I think the independent media space is becoming better at providing real incentives and, and, and real value to their members and their customers. Yeah, I was at um, Black Dog Coffee nearby on Friday and someone came up to me and, you know, I've only been on the show for a little while, mm. so it doesn't happen all the time, but he was like, hey, I love the work that you guys do. And I was like, oh my gosh, thanks so much. And he's like, yeah, where else am I supposed to get my news? Which I found really interesting. It's telling uh, people rely on alternative media in a way that even a decade ago, they couldn't have. And in sort of like the sphere of influencer marketing, it's something no one could have predicted because it's a, it's a break from the traditional model built on technology that didn't exist 20 years ago. Yeah. Well, let's jump to this story from TimCast.com. Washington Post downplays its own poll that shows Trump beating Biden by 10 points. The poll found 56% of Americans disapproving of Biden. Take a look at this. I'll just jump right to 538. The last two polls we have from ABC News and the Washington Post show Trump is up 10 points and nine points. I love this because if you even go back to, to last week, you do it. Biden does have a poll right here against Trump. He's up two, but you've got Trump up three in this one, up five, up three. It looks like, and, and what, what do we have? One of them's big. One of them's got like 6,000 uh, morning console. No, these are older ones. Yeah, I guess uh, they, they must change this a lot. Talking about this earlier, you've got this one from September, September 15th, 2,500 people. Trump's up one point. Let's go back here. 3,000 registered voters. Harris X, Trump is up five. Yeah, so they, they, they did change this from what I was reading earlier. But uh, you can see basically when it's not Trump, when it's Youngkin, DeSantis, when it's Haley. Uh, actually, Haley beats Joe Biden. Wow, surprising. But you can see that Trump's winning. That's it. We did not have this in the 2020 cycle. So if it, it would stand to reason if the election were held today, Joe Biden loses. Yeah. But, but how's he doing in the in the crucial states, though? Um, uh, I, I don't know. That's a good question. I can say that this poll also found among independents, Trump is up, I think, like 11. So that matters. Independent voters matters for the swing states. But the swing states themselves, it's a, it's a, a more important question individually. I think Trump just needs to win... What does he need, like Arizona, Georgia, and Wisconsin or something? Wisconsin. Yeah, good luck. Because that's not even a question of sentiment. It's a question of, it's a question of procedure. Trump's going to need to overcome massive procedural biases against him with these states. I'm not surprised at these poll numbers. Everybody that I talk to, they would take Trump over Biden any day. But I am surprised that the Washington Post actually released it. 
And that kind of gives me a little bit concerned because maybe they might start putting these out to kind of put the narrative in that, oh, the Democrats need to replace Joe Biden because everybody's been talking about he'll eventually be replaced, mm -hmm. but we don't know how it's going to come. I don't see him just stepping down. So they might try to take him out with some sort of scandal or maybe they just start highlighting actual polls and say, actually, Biden's not doing too good. We got to get somebody out of there. I think you're totally right. I think a lot of it is The Washington Post uh, acknowledging that at least within their internal structure, there is they are questioning Joe Biden. And this comes right. It coincides with the date that they set for the DeSantis Newsom debate. Right. So that's November 30th. Now, we know that there are people who would like to see a, a DeSantis Newsom 2024 uh uh, race that that's what they ultimately want uh i think that there is no clear way i mean we've talked about it a fair amount on the show there's no clear way for them to just swap out biden for newsom it would be sort of a dramatic uh production but there is enough bifurcation within the party that they they don't know that they actually want to see biden there uh there's another poll that came out today i think the company called harris x that found uh, you know among voters biden is ahead but uh, Kennedy is consistently gaining ground. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is consistently gaining ground. People are interested in him. And then there is a, a huge portion of voters, even among registered Democrats, uh, you know, 16 percent at least, that say that they would want someone else. They aren't happy with, you know, Marion Williamson, uh, RFK Jr. or Biden, but they also don't know who would be there. I mean, you get you see that there is sort of a, a rumbling to see if, if maybe someone else would would step up. Um, I don't know. It's crazy. I mean, RFK Jr. has initially came out, I think, around 5%, and he's consistently climbed. He, I'm seeing him poll consistently well, he's, 10, he 12, 16%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think uh, they've just lost control of the machine, right? They, they, there's nothing, they, they can't do anything about it. Yeah. If Biden was the best they could muster, they're screwed. Yeah. But they don't have a clear way to handle getting rid of him. And I think I've always thought it was that biden himself wants to stay for as long as possible why would he want to step down he's i, I in my opinion it, obviously in ill health uh, and so that's why you would get his press secretary saying oh well he's still considering what to do even when biden had made statements saying no i intend to run again uh this went on for a long time it was sort of strange and then he sort of rolled out this video campaign discreetly he announced via video that he was going to run for a second election or a second term uh, i think it wouldn't be the case if they really felt he was in a strong position in terms of his policies and his health. I think that they would celebrate him as the incumbent if they if they really believed in him and the Democratic Party doesn't. Yeah. But like that's becoming more and more obvious every day. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's eventually going to be a point, like Tim talked about how if Newsom comes and saves uh, Biden passing out on stage or something like that, there's going to be a point where that's going to happen. It's just going to take like a couple a couple more polls that are indicating the right, the, you know, for us, I guess you could say, uh, something that we would like seeing Trump ahead of him. Just a couple more. So, I think yeah. we're like right there. I think we're seeing a repeat of, um, uh, uh, who, who am I thinking of? Uh, the Supreme Court justice who everyone wanted to step down and then she didn't. Um, oh, uh, Bader Ginsburg? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg was, was, they were trying to time it so that mm -hmm. a, a Democrat could appoint her. And there were a lot of people who said she stayed too long and then ultimately uh, died when Donald Trump was in office and that was such a disaster. I think in some ways Biden's going to do the same thing, which is he really should step down. And he said, you know, all sorts of things when he was running. He, he made it overtures as if he would be a one-term president, but he was really sort of here to defeat Donald Trump. And obviously now, ego before everything else, he doesn't want to give up his seat, or at least the powers that have kept him in his seat don't want him to go. Uh, I, I think Trump wins 2024. Yeah. Easily. I mean, I don't know about easily. I think there's gonna be a lot of crazy that happens, but I just think narratively, Trump's going to win. Who do you think is... Uh, it's, the Elon, Elon, it's Elon Musk. Elon Musk's adage, right? Mm. The most entertaining outcome tends to be, is it what, Elon's razor? Or yeah. did someone else come up with that? That's someone else's quote, isn't it? The most entertaining outcome tends to be... The, I thought it was Elon Musk, but maybe he's just uh, passed it off well. I just can't imagine a world in which we don't get another term of Donald Trump. I just don't know. But, but like all the pieces lined up on the chessboard. Biden? I mean, to be fair, a, a Biden presidency is also comical. You know what I mean? Like at this point in his life, seeing like the president wheeled out to the podium in a wheelchair with a burlap, with like a little blanket on his lap. And he's like, Arr! and you're like, I, you know, spicy. It's a uh, comical, but boring. costly. I don't know that we could actually do it. Who do you think vice, the vice president be? If Who, who do you think Trump's going to pick as a vice president? Because I, I feel know. like his I... vice president is actually going to be sort of important. I mean, given everything. Christine Ohm. Yeah. Yeah. You, you guys really think that a Republican can, can win 
in 2024, given how the electoral process has changed since COVID? Yes. I mean, those changes. Trump only lost still... by 42,000 votes in 2020. Yes, but in my opinion, the way elections are, are run uh, in many states, it systematically dis disadvantages Republicans. Of course it does. But Trump only lost by 42,000 votes. The advantage Democrats had with universal mail-in voting was everyone was locked inside their homes and they couldn't leave. They don't have that advantage anymore. So they'll need something. And but then, we've had other elections since since um, November 2020, and it, it hasn't really turned out that well for Republicans. Because Republicans are only just now starting to wake up to the issue. And again, we're talking about an electoral system where Trump lost by 42,000 votes in three states, which could easily be made up, versus individual members of Congress in key districts, where we were like, wow, we're surprised they did not do better. Well, yeah, I mean, in Lauren Boebert's district, she came really close to losing. My favorite thing about that is, as soon as she pulled ahead slightly, her opponent, I think Frisch was his name, was like, no, no, no recount, no recount. <laughs> like, what do you mean? No. No, let's let's go through every single bell with a fine tooth comb. No, I think the issue is universal mail-in voting did play a role. It does benefit Democrats, but demographic shift because of COVID de benefits Democrats. But the issue really comes down to, do Democrats have the same edge the first time around? Is Joe Biden building confidence? And we're talking about one man at a national level and not individual members of Congress. Because what we did see is that you, you're likely, you were likely to get, and this happened in 2018 as well, if you were a Democrat but moderate, you got elected. There were 31 moderate Democrats that were like, we don't want to fight with Trump. We want to focus on health care, your wages, things like that for you guys. You know, unions, we want to work for you guys. And so they voted for these dudes. That moderate message works. People care more about kitchen table issues than they do about anything else. Now the issue is with Trump, okay, at the local level, you know that you can vote for a Democrat. You know the guy. He's got a much, you know, it's, it's a smaller uh, constituency. And maybe you talk to him and you trust him. But you've known that four years of Biden has been really, really bad. So you're like, you might, you'll might, probably get a lot of independents that are going to be like, yeah, maybe vote for a libertarian Democrat or some middle position, but then vote for Donald Trump for president because that's the practical solution. So yes, can Donald Trump win? Yeah, he only lost by 42,000 votes. Yeah. How could he not win? Like that's that, that that's that that's probably like a million bucks in spending on ads they could have done to get Trump those the, those ballots. Yeah, I and I think in 2020 Trump was kind of looked at as the villain uh, amongst Democrats, yeah. and even now uh, going into 2024, he's kind of fondly missed people Definitely. miss the days of trump and they're not so angry at him because they didn't have to deal with him every day for four years i don't think it's going to be the same outcome as 2020 yeah. yeah i think there's also a lot of people that have watched the outcome of what their uh, their choice was in the ballot box and have seen what it, the result of there's been there's you see people in interviews all the time saying i voted for Biden last time i'm not going to vote for him this time and they feel they're more like tim always says you, you say like people would crawl through broken glass to vote for trump i feel like there Trump's are more base. people yeah exactly yeah but there are more and more people that are like that. They're but I think there's there. a lot of people that are just like, I ain't crawling over glass for anybody and I'm out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People, vote, people voted Good against point. Trump and all that happened was things got worse and now we're at war and they're probably mm -hmm. just like. Pfft. Do you think voter turnout will be particularly le le particularly low in 2024? Sorry, I'm stuttering today. Uh, I don't know. I th what, what, how, what, what was it last time around? I thought it was going to be really high in 2020. I'm not sure. I didn't think mm -hmm. it was high. It was high among young people. Oh, yeah, no, that's largely because of mail-in voting, right? Yeah. I, think, mm -hmm. I think it was the... Uh, it was super high. Yeah, I thought it was going to be super high. And then, uh, what do we have here? Voter turnout in 2020. I mean, it's hard It's hard to say because population growth. Mm, yeah. Oh, wait. No, look at this. Voter. T oh, this is percentage of voter turnout. This is amazing. In, uh, per year. let's say, 1800, voter turnout was 7%. <laughs> wow. No, wait, what? U.S. presidential election popular vote totals is a percentage of the total U.S. population. Wow. That is insane. Yeah, that's... Yo, in, in 1912, voter turnout was under 20%. It was 18%, 17%. It looks like, yeah, 17%. No, wait, 16%. Wow. Yeah, I'm impressed. <laughs> and that's yeah, turned out over total population, though? 16% mm -hmm. of the U.S. population population voted for the uh, voted in the presidential election in uh, 1912. So today we got 50%. That's not bad, man. You look at even during the Civil War, nobody was voting. Nobody cared. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, wow. well, a lot less people could have voted too. Percentage-wise, well, I'm just saying. I like, see what you're saying. Voting right. was restricted, so right. I wonder like what the turnout is. Well, there you go. Amongst 
uh, suffrage. registered voters. Right. Yeah. It yeah. doubles. 1920. Yeah. Women yeah. love going out to do things. Oh, no. Let's tell that, you. That's, that, that looks like it's about it. Like, uh, just shy of 20%, suffrage happens, and it's just shy of 40%. So it mm -hmm. looks like it's slightly mm -hmm. more than doubled. And now, uh, since then, it's gone slightly, sl it's been trending upwards. Yeah. And uh, this only goes up to 2016, by the way, but I'm pretty sure 2020 was the biggest. Yeah, 81 heard that before as well. yeah people are like 81 million votes for biden that so. didn't happen I mean, i'm like they were mailing out ballots to people's homes <laughs> right so it wasn't turnout it was uh part voter participation, participation. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. we'll yeah. see what happens i think it'll go down in 2024 actually i'm curious based on that in california do you see lots of political signage already like i know in parts of west virginia the trump signs went up in 2016 and have stayed the whole time do you see pro biden signs like what what are you seeing on the ground where you live i can probably say that i've never seen a pro biden sign um even after biden won some of my neighbors still had their trump flags up the trump flags and signs were going up for a while you know kind of in protest um but i see f biden shirts or um let's go brandon was a lot there's nobody who's really motivated for biden just yeah. from what i've seen yeah well, what was the um the let's go Brandon stuff that blew up. There was like a whole yes. second wave of not even t technically pro Trump, but just anti Biden but I, stuff. I, that I tweeted appeared. about this the other day. Um, it's still kind of an anti Trump sentiment. I was pulling into a parking lot and I see a guy. He's got a sticker on the back of his car it says Trump twenty twenty four. My window was down, so I was almost gonna say yo, like I see you, bro. <laughs> but I get closer. It's Trump twenty to twenty four years in prison. Oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> He faked you out. I wish you had said something. <laughs> right. Like, I know. I don't like that guy. Uh, I find that interesting because I, I, I've always like lived in more liberal leaning areas where if you like any kind of conservative or libertarian, you tend to keep it to yourself. Uh, but every once in a while, you'll be somewhere and you'll see there's one house on the block that is like, I don't care. I'm putting up my political signs. And they're typically 45 pro Trump signs. There's this mm -hmm. one house that I pass in the area that'll have this flag of like Trump standing over eagles and like, you know, he's like, just like a caricature. But there are, there's no equivalent for Joe Biden. There is maybe vote Joe Biden because you like the Democrats, but there's not this same sort of belief in his capabilities, in, in my opinion. And I think that's just because people voted for Joe Biden because they wanted to get Trump out. He mm. was he was the anti-Trump guy. They weren't necessarily so gung-ho about Biden. They just didn't like Trump that much that they would vote for Biden to get Trump out. So they're not incentivized to wave the Biden flags or buy some Biden merch in the same way that pro-Trump voters were. Mm -hmm. and they're definitely not super fans. <laughs> They're not like the Trump base, that's for sure. Right. Even yeah. like, I remember there was a lot of Obama merch back in the day. And he, yeah. he had it, mad hype. Hillary mm -hmm. Clinton, she had a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm I with her. her H's all everywhere. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Joe Biden's just never captured that attention any of the times he's run, run for president. No, no way. If you live in a neighborhood where um, people feel safe and comfortable to put up political signage of d different diverse views, uh, consider yourself quite fortunate um, coming from Portland, Oregon. If... <laughs> You, you didn't even. If you expressed any type of dissenting views, your property would be highly likely subjected to mm -hmm. violence or potentially even serious violence, like arson or such. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, let, let me let me pull up the story real quick. Just to put a, put a pin in that. We have this from the Post Millennial. Yeah. Leader in Richmond Democrat Party group posted bomb threat against Andy No Virginia Talk. The post included an image of dynamite with Jarvis writing the description box on my way to the Andy No event. So you've you've experienced this stuff. I think everyone knows directly covering the extremism. Do you want to elaborate on what you're talking about? Uh, well, you know, we because uh, the left has cultural dominance like, and they, they face no censure, or no um, social consequences for expressing radical and, and hateful uh, extremist beliefs. They just, they're able to push it further and further to the point where you can have somebody who's, I mean, we're not talking about somebody who's in black block um, Antifa type of groups. This is somebody who's in a leadership role and then in the Richmond City Democratic Committee, which is the official um, party, Democrat Party group in, in Richmond, Virginia, feeling confident and fine to put this type of post publicly. Um, and, and going back to what I was just saying a moment ago, the, those uh, leftists who feel empowered to go and destroy people's properties because of their expressing a different political view. So, you know, my, my heart is warm just to hear Claire just talk briefly about, you know, the different type of political science that she's seen in places she lives. 
don't take that for granted. If you're an American who lives in one of those places, consider yourself lucky because there are places like Portland, Seattle, obviously different boroughs of New York where you you are potentially put yourself and your family at risk for expressing a mainstream political view. Mm-hmm. Well, and they had that guy whose biker neighbor went and lit his uh, Trump sign on fire. I mean, there are places yeah. that people do feel entitled to. Uh, well, check. they weren't neighbors, though. The guy lived kind of far I just away. meant that he biked yeah. in the area. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it's interesting. One of the things that you're saying reminds me of um, in your book, you talked about how people, uh, especially progressive groups, will travel to small towns and set up coffee shops or or bookstores and sort of become very visible in that sense. And that becomes sort of how they begin to have influence and control areas. So there are times that people are expressing their views because they are relying on the tolerance and the, the community's uh, ability to welcome them, even if they don't agree with them. And then they become sort of a destructive force in and of themselves. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We see this phenomenon all the time. People who... Um who adhere to certain principle of tolerance and then the other side gains power and that that uh, is not reciprocated back onto them mm-hmm. and they suffer as a result. I mean, conservatives experience that a lot, right? Mm-hmm. We, we want to welcome and protect all views of expression, but then you have those who are calling for an overturning of the entire system and a totalitarian system where people are subjected to violence potentially or deaths for their views and and I mean, I'm not saying that's manifested in real life necessarily anywhere in the U.S., but in, there's certain pockets where those type of sentiments are salient to a population and they're able to um, cause so much violence and, and destruction on those around them and, and, those, and the victims just have no ability to counter. Um, in, uh, so, so I was speaking in Richmond because Richmond is a city that... Um, has experienced uh, over the years a really radical cultural shift to the left. I think a lot of that has to do with the university there, the Virginia Commonwealth University. They had months of riots uh, in 2020, like Portland, and a lot of the same parallels uh, between Portland and Virginia I, I, I documented and in, in explored in the speech. You have um, so elected local officials, the mayor, or those on city council condoning um, the riots, um, even going out to some of those protests, turn riots to participate and give them support. Um, you have police whose ability to um, actually enforce the law is curtailed by the local politicians. And then um, you have outside agitators coming in uh, and with that, a lot of money. And it just creates, I mean, a lot of destabilization. I think, I think one, of the question, one of the questions I was asked when I spoke uh, on Friday was, like, could this happen again? And I say, well, yes, obviously, because the the same the networks that were strengthened and established in 2020 are not only still there, they're stronger now. And there might be a bit of protest and riot fatigue t- today, but just give it a bit of time and there will be some other George Floyd type moment that's caught on video, um, clipped, exploited and blasted on social media and it'll get people to the streets. Well, 2024 uh, is around the corner. It is It is about that time. Yeah. And right. I'm, 2020 mm-hmm. BLM, George Floyd election year, 2024, this next summer. But Richmond doesn't have any more monuments to pull down. What it are they going to do? Be Richmond. <laughs> it's, it, it could be literally anywhere. And the issue is the media lies. So let's say... Um, Let's 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 say something like this. 2024, and there's like some dude working in his garage in the suburbs of I don't know some let's say uh, Youngstown, Ohio. He's in his garage, and then uh, some dude sneaks into his garage and say grabs a, a a power tool case, a couple hundred bucks, and then runs for it. And this guy's been known to the neighborhood, so the dude calls the police. The guy's neighbor confronts the guy and. Jump, like stop, grabs him and stops him and they fight over the tool and then the the dude who is stealing it you know falls on hits his head and dies the media will report that two white men approached a man who was walking down the street a black man and they mercilessly beat him to death and then you'll get your riots and then a month later the video will be released from their ring security camera showing the guy robbing the house and it'll be just like Ahmed Arbery and they, they will find any story they can to create a racially charged atmosphere that will result in riots 
And then they'll use that to claim racism or whatever. And then the people who are correctly calling out this story does not, you know, follow that line. They'll say, aha, they're racist. This prove it. Don't vote for Republicans, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Did you guys see the story? It was kind of inverse to that. Uh, of course, it didn't get coverage because the victim was white. But I guess um, these two black dudes pulled up to a basketball court and they got into a fight with the white guy. Black dude hits the white guy and white guy falls on his head, dies. They went to trial, uh, beat an involuntary manslaughter charge, and were only convicted of assault. Mm -hmm. There you go. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I saw that. Yep. What's gonna happen with 2024 is they don't need there to be an actual instance of like racism or violence. The media will just make it up. Garage pull rope, it's a noose. Well, Trump being a, a, the Republican nominee would, just that would get people out on the streets. I mean, in 26... 2015 and in early 2016 that was such a powerful propaganda coup for antifa because you know before their their messaging extremist messaging is come comes out through their pamphlets and texts and their blogs which reaches a smaller audience with trump being the nominee at that time then now they have the entire liberal media establishment saying the exact same prop talking points uh, uh, America might elect a fascist, and then after the election, America did elect a fascist. Uh, death camps are around the corner, mass deportations around the corners. I mean, this sounds crazy as they say it now, but look back on the opinion pieces and headlines that were published in the papers or record. Those were the type of sentiments that they were putting out. It brainwashed a lot of useful idiots on the left to go out and be much more accepting of political violence on their side. I don't know why or how this happened, but I feel like amongst my generation and the younger generations coming up, political violence and vitriol is just so high. And it really rubs me the wrong way to see that people aren't even accepting of just opposing beliefs. It's either my way or the highway. You're evil. If you're evil, I can go after you and hurt you because I am the good guy. I want to I want to highlight this. I, I, I saw this from Jack Posobiec, but... Uh... I just, just verified the articles. Here's an article from Slate, November 19th, 2015. Donald Trump is actually a moderate Republican. That's why he's winning. November 19th, 2015. And then on November 25th, 2015, <laughs> Donald Trump is a fascist. Now hold on. The original article, Donald Trump is a moderate, written by Jamel Bowie. And the second article, written by Jamel Bowie. The same dude a week later. He wrote Trump is a moderate, why he's winning. Then he wrote Trump is a fascist. Why? They are evil. There is no legitimate reason why a sane person would say, I'm going to write an article calling Trump a moderate. And then a week later, be like, I'm going to write an article. Oh, no. Oh, I just discovered he's actually a fascist. No, what happened was everybody was going after Trump. So this person probably thought, if I write that he's a moderate, I bet I get a ton of traffic from people who are going to be like, what? What do you mean? How? 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 And then a week later, okay, been there, done that. I'm going to write Trump's a fascist and get a million, million more views. Welcome to the media. Yeah, I think you're right. It's 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 part of the clickbait. They need you to be so shocked by the things they're saying and these points that they're putting out there. Uh, I, I find the hysteria around Donald Trump to be completely personality-based. I bet most people can't really distinguish anything about his political platforms. Or I should clarify, most people who are identifying as progressive journalists. They they don't know the nuances of differences between Republicans. They just know that Trump does things they don't like and they don't like him the most. And so therefore, whatever they have to say to make him the bad guy. Uh, it, it is weird. There are times when you'll see sort of more left-leaning outlets almost praise other Republicans to make Donald Trump look bad when there's sort of no informed opinion other than they aren't Trump, so therefore they're, whatever they're doing is okay. Mm -hmm. But th this type of disinfo that causes hysteria and panic is so dangerous. Right? I mean, when you ingrain into, let's say, 50% of the population that that um, this uh, Republican front runner is, is, is a fascist, then that label then is applied, obviously, to people who would vote for him and those who support for him. And then what, 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 what do good moral people do against fascists? Well, we want to bash them. And it normalizes that type of acceptance of political violence. I'm speaking, unfortunately, as somebody who's been a victim of the violence of Antifa because of these labels that have been applied to me. And then, I mean, with my, the event that I just spoke at in Richmond, the script that was going out to these different venues that, that canceled and took the third venue for me to actually be able to speak, 
people would just call in and, and say things like, you have a neo-Nazi who's speaking, there are armed neo-Nazis who are coming, and this event goes forward, people could actually die. And people in corporate PRs are just freak out. They're like, okay, well, they'll cancel it. And that that's the danger, I think, of, you know, we, we can laugh at this and look back and because I think we're all of us here at the table are, are grounded. But there are actually so many people, even highly educated, perhaps it's the most educated who are vulnerable to this type of hysteria and disinfo. But I, you know, we I, I take it so seriously and I, um, I, I'm so angry at how... Um, sloppily people use these labels of like fascist and yeah, like dictator yeah. and all these type of terms as as if it's like okay to just throw it around and apparently now you know people just do that with like reckless abandon yeah. and it's like you you know people who um instill that into their beliefs like actually take take up weapons and like maim and like kill people on that belief that happened in portland with a, a self-described antifa member who shot dead a Trump supporter because he really thought this guy was this white supremacist fascist, just murdered him in downtown. Yep. So you were saying before that you felt like the younger generations are sort of fueled by this political divisiveness so they won't listen to other people. And it it makes sense because they're completely surrounded by it. Uh, there's no escape and there's no accuracy in reporting. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I, I always wonder if there is going to be a reckoning at which at what point, you know, we had, uh, I can't remember who it was, maybe Marjorie Taylor Greene on a couple, a year ago or so, and uh, someone who was at the table said, oh, I'd actually never listened to anything but random clips of you, and hearing you talk, it definitely changed my opinion, or it gave me an insight, uh, and I, I find this really interesting because I think there are so many people who aren't exposed to anyone, but other people who are similarly afraid of these labels of fascist and you know anyone who's brushed by the, these words are obviously out to get them and so there is a natural it almost makes sense resistance to it you you don't want to be affiliated with them but if the if you're, you're completely right if the labels are are misused then their fear and their uh, willingness to maybe react violently is based on inaccurate information during the trump years i would always try to reach out to the other aisle just because it was like uh it was it was a hot topic you know and i would always hear from people wow you're actually the first trump supporter i've talked to which is crazy because how have you ignored half of the country you you've just been so tight-knit in your bubble that you haven't even thought of you know what let me check out the other side i i used to be a democrat back in the day and then when i was uh coming of voting age i said to myself I'm going to make an informed decision. I will check out both the right and the left. And I just found that the right made more sense to me. And I wish more people would do that. What made you want to do that, though? Because I think it is unusual. I think young people tend to be like, oh, this is what my, how my family votes. This is how my friends vote. The you know. thing that made me want to do that was intro to logic. I took that my first year in college. And I learned how to critically think. And this was also around the time where BLM first wave was popping off. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like how they kind of wanted to make black people the victim so much. So that was rubbing me the wrong way. And then I took intro to logic and I said, let me think objectively rather than subjectively. Let me go outside of my bubble. Let me see what's on both sides. And then the right made more sense for me. Yeah. I think people don't want to be outside their bubble. I think, and, and, and conservatives are guilty of this too, that we shouldn't, you know, pretend otherwise. But some people just want to be told the way they see the world is completely correct. They want to have all their biases confirmed always. But I think that's, What's really dividing the the left and the right in the culture war is no longer politics. I think it's obvious to anybody who's been watching a show like this for a long time. It is simply, are you someone who is an independently minded person or are you someone who is terrified of being shunned? Democrats basically just march in lockstep with whatever acceptable opinion is, whatever popular thing currently is. And it changes and catches people off guard and they get yelled at and they apologize and they freak out. The reason why they'll get so irrationally angry at the idea of you defending Donald Trump is because they know, you know, you're right. When when they when the media lies about Donald Trump and then you say, well, you know, Trump never did that. They'll start yelling at you. Why are you defending him? Why? The reason they're getting angry is because they're like, uh oh, I'm going to get ostracized. I will get targeted if you keep talking like this. I've got to show that I'm I'm against him. I'm not one of you. Yeah, they kind of mm -hmm. it's like they realize what they've been doing for so long and they realize they can turn against him, you know. It's like when, uh, was it was it David Hogg said he, he was going to keep wearing masks even though they got rid of the yeah. mandates because yeah. he didn't want someone to think he was a Republican. Yeah, they are wild. so terrified of yeah. being the out group. So what happens is it doesn't matter if you're pro-life, pro-choice. It matters, are you in the cult or not? Mm -hmm. You can be in the cult and you can be someone like 
you know, Adam Kinzinger, Liz Cheney, or Joe Walsh. They are obvious cult members. It's the funniest thing to see Democrats have a high approval rating for George W. Bush. So yeah, long as you are like part of the machine cult, the cathedral, you know, there you go. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you guys think people on the right are um, a bit too loose in, in their accusations of their political opponents of being communists and socialists? No. Nope. You don't? No. Nope. Why? So there is, uh, as we, we've been talking about this quite a bit over the past couple of weeks, the banality of evil and malicious evil, or, you know, as I go even further, say abject evil. So how did the Nazis, how were they able to pull off what they pulled off? I've got, I, I, where, where did we hear this? I think someone was talking about it here on the show, maybe, that there was a group of uh, regular guys that were conscripted in World War II, and when they were, they, they became police officers, and when they were ordered to just start, you know, gunning down and, and uh, rounding up the Jewish people for the concentration camps, without question, they just did as they were told. Michael Malice often says that there is a, I, I don't know, I don't know, I can't say the exact quote, I'll paraphrase, but something to the effect of, there is no crime so egregious that police would not carry it out if ordered to, up and in, uh, including, up to and including the murder of children. I, I certainly think that would be the that would be the case if they were instructed to do so, as we saw in Lahaina, when uh, we have all these missing children and people are saying that they were in the cars trapped, and the police were blocking the exit to Lahaina so that people were trapped on the road and they were burning to death. And then some of these people jumped out of their cars and jumped into the water while the cops held the road closed because yep. they don't care. Now, did those officers wake up and decide that they were going to go murder a bunch of people? Of course not. They were stupid people who did not care for the responsibilities of their job, who were told, don't let anyone leave town. Not explicitly, but they said, shut this road down. And they went, you got it. And so while the fires were burning people to death, they were cops like, don't care. So when it comes to the accusations of the right, on the left. From the right. Uh, yeah, from, from the right, ab about the left, then uh, th that's what I meant by on the right, they're making these accusations. I don't think it's uh, incorrect to say that they're communists. Did every single communist in the Soviet Union who supported the system or participate in it know that they were communists? Did they read literature on Marx or they're just doing as they were told? They were just doing as they were told. It was the commonplace ignorance that led to these evil actions. Mm -hmm. So you have high profile individuals like uh, people in the Fulton County DA's office charging Donald Trump. They're evil. You have the people in New York City that are uh, filing these lawsuits, falsely accusing Trump of things or trying to charge him on these, tr these, these, these BS charges. You've got the documents case against them. All of this is complete garbage nonsense. You have the Democrats who in 2016 claimed falsely that Russia w manipulated the election to help Donald Trump win and Trump was illegitimate. Then 2020 comes around and when, when the opponents of Biden start saying similar things about fraud, they say, you're all crazy psychopaths, et cetera, et cetera. They are a combination of all things evil. Powerful interests at the top who say things like, can't we just drone this guy in reference to Julian Assange in London? Hillary Clinton is evil. But then you have the blind, ignorant followers. So if you have high profile activists who raise hundreds of millions of dollars who say that they are Marxists explicitly, that's Black Lives Matter. And then you have people marching in the street, throwing up the red salute in support of overt communism. <laughs> They're communists. Yeah, they right. don't have to sit there and, and, and put their hand on the on the Bible of uh, of, of Marx, <laughs> Das Kapital and things like that. They just need to be cogs in the machine that actively support the, the issue of communism. Yeah. And then you have people breaking free from that saying, I don't want to be involved. And that's fine. They can. But for the time being, if BLM is coming out saying they're trained Marxists and then I see videos of millennials and Gen Z doing the red salute. Oh, bro, they're communists. Like, mm -hmm. if you saw a 17-year-old kid marching around, goose-stepping and doing a, a, a Roman salute, you'd be like, he's a Nazi. Yeah. Oh, well, hold on. <laughs> Did he actually read Mein Kampf? Does he actually? No, come on, dude. <laughs> Wait, we don't, put, we don't play those games. So the issue now is high-profile activists to, to the tunes of millions of dollars buying property, having the, the slogans so ubiquitous that Amazon and Walmart use them. Like, okay, yeah, they're, 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 they're in the style of Chinese communism. They are authoritarian, call them whatever you want. They adhere to, a, to some kind of Marxist ideology, likely as a means of manipulating. I think it's probably better to call them neo-fascist or something like this. A lot of people call them neo-Marxist, but I'm like, I don't think they actually believe what Marx believed. They're using Marxist ideas to manipulate stupid people in, into being controlled. Yeah. So it's something else neo-fascistic maybe whatever but call them whatever you want to call them marxist communists 
it applies to all of them. Yeah. And you can and you can wake up one day and be like, oh, that was bad that I was doing that. There's a guy who uh, I retweeted a while ago. He was a doctor and he tweeted that he was completely wrong about the lockdowns and he apologizes the data was bad and he regrets his, where he was. And I'm like, see, there you go. You know, somebody who says, whoa, I can't believe what I was doing. Yeah. And you can only really do that in the one direction. You can do it from the left going to the right. You can't really do it from the, you can't really do it from the left or you can't really do it from the right going to the left. I don't think the left would just never have you. No, they do. They 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 have their their. I I think it's all fake. The people were like, mm. you know, I I was a Trump supporter, and then I realized they were lying. No, you didn't. That's a lie. Yeah. That's not true. Mm. Because the the far right, as as defined by the media and the establishment, includes libertarians who hate Donald Trump. Yeah, true. So it's like somebody who was, you know, I'm sure there are people who have been blue pilled, who have been manipulated and tricked into believing lies from the machine. But mm. you have to be really insane or really broken to read facts about how the media lied, which brings you to Donald Trump, and then be like, yeah, but then I started reading more of the of, of, of NBC News and really just decided not to fact check it. It's like that simple. I'll, I'll give you an example. Burisma is the best example, especially with everything that's going on. There's no circumstance in which you can unlearn the Burisma scandal. Yeah. And if you go and say, I don't support Trump, you know, Biden's the guy for me, Go into a circle of Democrats and say, oh, yeah, but you know about Victor Shokin, right? When he signed the sworn affidavit saying Biden got him fired, they're going to be like, you're a Nazi. You're far right. Get out. Yeah. I forget, be, I forget who it was that you were talking to. Who brought, you read up on the show about that. And they had, knew nothing about it. I can't remember who it was now. So well, that's Brianna Wu. Yeah, that's right. right? That's right. It that's was right. Hunter yeah. Avalon. Yeah. They have no idea the stuff happened. Or they're lying and saying they didn't know that, that it happened. Feel but the reality right. is. The people who are like, oh, you know, I was a Trump supporter and now I'm not. Okay, maybe you are a Trump supporter because you were living under a rock and your neighbor said he was voting for Trump. So you said, sure, but you're certainly not someone who pays attention. Yeah. What's your take? Do you think that people are inaccurate when they criticize the left as being communist? Um, well, if Tim is specifically talking about the militant activists who use those symbols that are associated with communism, well, clearly those, those are apt um, labels for them. I just, you know, I, I cringe often when I just, when I see people on the right very kind of loosely just calling random, uh, large swaths of the political opposition, just, you know, they're all, these are all just all communists. Or we're using, using the term fascist as well. It just, mm -hmm. uh, one's true and one's not. Language is so important and meaning in the definitions of words is important. And um, I just, you know, I think, playing the same game of what the left does of just you know their disregard of how they who they call fascist or who they call far right whatever i think the right should be very care careful not to mirror that in the same way unfortunately maybe that i think that's so that boat has already sailed but why shouldn't they mirror it are you implying that they're only saying it because it was said of them yes and it's it's about sort of like just this rhetorical claim of like okay, you call us, you know, you, you're so loose with the word uh, fascist on, on our side. We're, we're just going to call all of you But that's uh, not communists. what's happening. It is a fact that they're communists. It is not a fact. Some of them. But they, but right. So you're defining communist as someone who is a learned red communist as opposed to the banality of communism. Not even necessarily learned. They could just, I mean, somebody who's just finds appeal in the basic tenets of communism. Like, like particularly would, would, if, if a guy is uh, puts on a black hoodie and runs around with Antifa smashing things, is he a communist? Not necessarily. He, he might identify as a, a militant anarchist. That's well, a big part of the anti but, but that's But that's not anarchy. Anarchy meaning without authority, right? So they can call themselves whatever they want. I don't care. That's not true. A anar anarchists are not violent, right? Well, if the far left... The, if, there are if, examples in, in 20th century European history of, you know, anarchist ideologues who've carried out assassinations and other types of violence. So I would, I would argue the core of the of the phrase without authority would displace a person from the use of violence and someone who wants to claim they're an anarchist who then engages in say throwing dynamite in a market or something like that they're not an anarchist that's an authoritarian action anarchy is quite literally the word and without archy authority anybody who believes that there is no authority of the system one could make the philosophical argument that they're trying to strip authority from the system that's why they're an anarchist that's not correct in 
most an most anarchist philosophy. That's why you'll find among libertarians and what people refer to as right anarchists, the non-aggression principle. If you use violence against another person, it's an assertion of your authority over them, which defies itself. What, what, what is actually happening is if you look at the anarchist communities, they have inherently tanky authoritarian views on how to run society. Then they just say, but I'm an anarchist. Sure. Like, dude, just because you're stupid doesn't mean you're not a communist. If they believe Marxist ideology, utilize that ology to and, and, and utilize violence to that end, they're not anarchists. They are someone who believes in an authority, believes in a system, believes that it should be done the way they want it done, and that they are the ones who have the, the right to use cause of death to get that. That's not anarchy. Mm -hmm. So this, this is the issue that we've always had going back to Occupy Wall Street, when these dudes would dress up in all black. And people would call them the anarchists and stuff. And we would colloquially, colloquially, colloquially say it sometimes, but being friends with a bunch of anarchists, especially with like Ron Paul, Ron Paul revolution only a few years before, we were like, that's not anarchy. Running around smashing windows and beating people up because they don't agree with you is quite literally what anarchists are opposed to. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you argue that the police, for instance, were doing something wrong and they were abusing people or saying the street was frozen, you couldn't go there. It was an arbitrary exercise of authority over people that was ill-gotten. It was, it, was, it, was, it was false. When people started putting on hoodies and masks, a uniform, going around saying, do what we say or we will physically strike you, I was like, identical to the police. And they would go, that's so stupid. We are not. And I'm like, bro, two guys who are part of groups that dress the same and assert their authority, whether it's warranted or not. But but, but this is just the, the no true Scotsman argument. No, it's I, not. It's, I, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the, if someone comes to you and says they're a thing, does it mean they are a thing? No, it does not. Words define things. So if someone comes to you and they're clearly a white blonde guy and they say, actually, I'm a black guy from Nigeria, you're going to be like, you are actually a white guy, right? But if within political philosophies, if there, if there is a... If, a faction that identifies within this larger political ideology and they carry out actions that um in the name of this ideology i don't think we should necessarily just say well they're not acting truly in in for this particular cause i, I you know i i get into there are a lot of um women's rights activists who actually really disagree with the work i do because i i particularly talk about how a lot of these women's rights events it's Antifa, Trantifa, communists and, and socialists and violent far left coming up to attack these women who are speaking out about trans ideology. Well, a lot of these women who are speaking out are old school leftists who say, no, 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 no. These people, are, they're not leftists. They're not on our side. They have nothing to do with us. They're, they're, they're regressive. They, they're, not, they're not on the same side as, as, as us. And I think that type of denial, um, it, it's it's not reflective of the reality that the on the ground manifestation of political philosophy does change over time. You're not going to have necessarily a peer manifestation every time, but it's still part of that. And I think there, you know, I think within the wider anarchist community, you anarchists need to start asking themselves a bit more if they're not doing already. Why are some of the most prominent anarchists we see doing the direct action on the street are the militant Antifa? Because who are they're not anarchists. You like I, your, your position comes from the if a person declares themselves to be, they are. I, I disagree. If a communist came out and said, don't worry, I'm not a communist. That's Am not I going to be like, well, hold on, guys. They're not a communist. He's like he's, he's wearing, a, 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 you know, a, a, a blue jumpsuit with a little commie hat on holding Das Kapital and waving a communist flag is I am not a communist. I say, OK, he's not. He said he's not. So he's not right. That's 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 illogical. Well, that's not what I'm saying. I'm, you know, you can have. People can pick and um, uh, cherry pick whatever tech aspects of different texts or historical figures who are, may represent that political ideology and draw inspiration from it, from it and say that that is, you know, that they're a part of a longer tradition. It's just, I, I don't know, I, I, I just get frustrated when there's like a... So the, so the issue right now is... Not recognizing a problem on one own side, <clears throat> which I see the left does But the right is not lot. wrong to call them communists. So libertarians, conservatives, evangelicals, post-liberals, non-politically affiliated people comprise the far right. All of those people I just described, this disparate group of people who completely disagree with each other and will actually yell at each other in arguments are called one group fascists. All of them. That's nonsensical. 
and incorrect. Mm -hmm. You get a libertarian, you get Dave Smith in here, and he will tell you why he does not like Donald Trump. They will, but the media and the Democrats will still claim he's a Trump supporter. And he, I, there was a famous moment where he was on Fox News and they were like, you know, with Donald Trump, he's like, I don't care. I don't like Donald Trump. He's a libertarian. They can't differentiate. Everyone's a fascist. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the bulk, and actually this was, there was, there was a data point we, we brought up a couple years ago. It showed the cluster of political affiliation, a uh, 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 voting block based on social, political, uh, social and economic views. So it was a, it was a, it was a uh, two-dimensional grid or a, yeah, two-dimensional is a square showing, mapping out where you stand socially, socially progressive or conservative and economically progressive or conservative. Trump's voting base was spread all the way across the economic spectrum, but more socially conservative. And the entire Democrat voting base was clustered in one tight packed corner of socially and economically progressive. They all exist mostly in the same space. So we say, typically, they tend to be communists. I don't care what they call themselves. I'm identifying them. I don't care what they say. They say, we believe in Marxist ideas. We believe in critical race theory, critical gender theory. We believe in, in critical class theory. And I'm like, okay, these are communist ideas. They then say they want mass massive multinational corporations and centralized authoritarian power from the government to start arresting and locking up their political opponents while they celebrate and clap for it. You then have more militant factions like Antifa, et cetera, who will privately say or on, on, on you know, a personal level, they'll say, well, I don't like Joe Biden or the machine ever uh, either, but I will fight on their behalf. For example, when Trump supporters were outside of a hospital protesting masks, Antifa shut up and beat the crap out of them. Why are they defending a government decree? Because they're communists. They support the government doing what it wants under this leftist ethos of class, gender and race oppression. That's the bulk of the voting base in it graphed out and before us. They then call all of us fascists, despite the fact that libertarians and fascists are arguing with each other. Mm -hmm. So you can't just look at it and be like, it is stupid that the right calls the left communist because the left calls the right fascist. But that's not what's happening. It is one side is evil. One side is not evil. Why? I'm not saying people on the right are good. I'm saying whatever the right is, it's a disparate group of people. It is various different ideologies and factions having a discussion on why wokeness and the establishment machine is bad and the things that and, and calling out the lies from the mainstream media. The left overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly marches in lockstep with whatever the lie happens to be, even though it changes from from time to time, sometimes as quickly as a day. Wimixin, women with an X was the yeah. unoffensive thing. And then a day later, it was offensive because it was exclusionary. This is why they can't define words like woman. There is nothing to it. And, and this is a really great example of it. You can find people who are pro-life, pro-progressive tax. You can find people like Jimmy Dore who want universal health care, but they're right wing or fascist. That makes no sense. So that's clearly a false determination. But then you can look at the at the left and not a single one of them defines the word woman. And if they do, they use some nonsensical like we had Lance on the show. He said woman is an adult human female and trans women are female. It's like, OK, you see. <laughs> There's no logic there. They're marching in lockstep. But we got to go to Super Chats. Yep. So we can, we can, we'll carry on that conversation or whatever, my, my diatribe in uh, the members only section, but we'll read Super Chats for now and hear what y'all have to say, because I'm sure everybody's Super Chatting saying I'm wrong, which is, which is always welcome. So smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends, head over to TimCast.com. We're going to have that members only show coming up in about 20 minutes. But for now, we will read what y'all have to say. It's always welcome, but you could skip their Super Chats. <laughs> We have Bertman who says, Palmdale, come back to me. That's Chris Bertman, Let's our go. writer. Oh, he got six, the- 661 uh, in the building. He got the first chat, congratulations. Yeah. I'm not your buddy guy, says, I love how Trudeau just blamed Russian propaganda for our Senate, giving multiple standing ovations to an actual Nazi who was part of the SS. Wow. Yep. Trudeau says, don't look or question me when I do it. <laughs> yeah, rules for the- Waffle Sensei says, I really wish Rumble would have literally said pound sand tyrants in their letter back to the UK government. Missed opportunity. <laughs> oh, I think they did. It. I think they did right. You know, it was uh, it was polite. It was a polite. I'm sure Rumble doesn't want to burn bridges. You know, it's it's one thing if they're being aggressive later, but Rumble right. doesn't want to potentially be shut out completely. Shane Wilder says, watch, watch the presser from Eagle Pass today. I think Rep. Tony Gonzalez was spot on when he said, quote, we have to stop waiting on President Biden to solve this issue now to see if the Republican can do it. 
Yeah, look, I think the, it, it, Biden's not solving the issue. This is part of the plan. There's a video of CBP, I believe it's CBP, opening a gate at the border and letting people in and counting them. They are being instructed to open the border. That's it. So anybody acting like, you know, why won't why won't they get the job done? Because they they this is this is this is their plan. That's it. Yeah. Carry on. OMG Puppy says with Rumble, this is someone demonstrating their power. Someone like MI6, they won't accept losing. I think it's it seems fairly routine to be honest. Like, oh hey, we got an upstart big tech uh, so, or upstart social media company that's uh, got a high profile celebrity who's speaking out against the Ukraine war. Shut them down. Yeah. There you go. Bear in mind says I miss seeing you in my notifications. Yep. That's right. Yeah, I didn't see one today. Yep, no notifications pop up. Not if today. you uh, if you like the show, that's why I say share the show because probably the only reason the show still exists is because you guys share it. Did for did real. people used to get notifications or was oh, it yeah. from the beginning people yeah, yeah. were good? No, oh no, yeah, 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 it's, yeah, for it's sure. happening this week, but today no notification at all on my phone. Yeah. It, it it depends too. Because you don't appear on the trending channel or trending page, but you should, right? Oh, that's the funny thing too. When we put out um, the song "Only Ever Wanted" on Timcast Music, we were trending on YouTube. I think we were trending in the top ten or something like that, and then uh, or maybe it was top twenty. And then we put out the song "Genocide." Once again, we were trending, and I was like, "Look at that! Like our song right next to like Post Malone. That's crazy." Mm -hmm. But we were getting substantially less views. We got a couple hundred thousand views, and we were trending. And I'm like. Tim Cast IRL should be trending every single night. Yeah. We get a couple hundred thousand views in like an hour or two hours. Yeah. Based on those numbers. Yep. Mm -hmm. Nope. There's no, there's no real other explanation for it. Doesn't make they, any sense. If, if, you know, I, I'm sure their argument is if they allowed Tim Cast IRL to behave normally in the trend section, the same as every video, mm. every night Tim Cast would be a trending video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which would exponentially <laughs> increase the amount of viewers we get, the amount of subscribers we get, and then we'd be bigger than Mr. Beast. They do not want that to happen. Oh. So they suppress. That's yeah. it. Yeah, that's true. But if every single person who watched every single time shared this show, then we would be bigger. Mm -hmm. It would take a lot of work and uh, you know, it is what it is. All right, let's grab some more. We got Dallas Smith says, yo, Andy, good to see you doing well. I had fun working as your security during the Portland riots. Let me know if you need me again when you're in town. God bless. What was the username for that? Dallas Smith. Huh. No, doesn't to ring go back through your emails and see if you go, you have oh. a connection. Really it's cool that people who work security for you, you know, follow your work. Actually, yeah, it's not just a job for them; they really like you. There have been some uh, kind people who volunteered their time because you know private security is really expensive. And back then, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. cool. All right, what do we got? We got uh, S.A. Federale says this is the best podcast in history. But every single time Tim refers to Quad City style pizza as Chicago style pizza, he appropriates my culture. The west side of Illinois is the best side of Illinois. I am not saying you don't have the same kind of pizza. I'm saying real Chicago pizza is not deep dish. In Chicago, we eat Quad City style pizza. There you have it. That's my point. People go to Chicago and they're like, I want Chicago pizza. And they're like, right this way to the circus. They go. To, they bring you to a pizza place people from Chicago don't go to. You're saying deep dish pizza is a tourist trap. <laughs> yeah, it's great. You know, uh, Lumonati's is really, really good. We used to have a place, I don't know if it still exists, called Leona's. And that was really awesome because they like a cornbread crust deep dish. Awesome. Ooh, whoa. That's yeah, cool. it was really good. Really good. Yeah, uh, crumbly and delicious. And uh, Giordano's, of course, is very famous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody orders this stuff. There's uh, Uno's. Uno's. But uh, if you are a, if you grew up in Chicago with a neighborhood pizza place. It was like a flatbread, square cut pizza. Is this like, I don't know if this is true or not, but people who are from Chicago, like really from Chicago, like the White Sox, but then people who moved to Chicago, like the Cubs? I don't know. In my experience, if you're on the North side, you were a Cubs fan. If you're on the South side, you were a Sox fan. Oh, okay, it's regional. Yeah. I don't know anything about well, sports, either, to be honest. But. It was like, yeah, it's a Crosstown Classic. It's the, you know, North-South rivalry. It was like, you know, Everyone's like, you're on the South side, so you're supposed to be Cubs fans. I'm like, I don't know, my parents were from the North side or something. Uh, we went to Cubs games. Mm. Well, the best pizza in America is in New England, so go check it out. But the thing is, at the time, growing up, the Sox <laughs> were good and the Cubs luck. were losing. So it's like the Cub. I, I remember going to a Cubs game with my family. We left right away because they were losing so miserably. Really? Whoa. Yeah. That sucks. And then I remember when the White Sox won the World Series and uh, it was insane in Chicago. Just like people were crashing cars and mm -hmm. screaming. And, like, <laughs> it went insane. That's nuts. 
And then when the Cubs won the World Series, there was like nothing happened. <laughs> Every, everybody because it, was, it wasn't in Chicago I guess right. uh, it makes a big difference I guess but everybody was surrounding Wrigley Stadium while they were playing you know uh, I forgot what they were playing were they playing Cleveland or something and then uh, once it ended and everyone cheered for the Cubs finally having won after like 100 years or whatever everyone just walked to the train <laughs> I think someone broke a window but then they, they got yelled at and the cops came and arrested them or something no, like, that was it everyone just walked and they're like woo and there was like well I guess nobody's drinking they're hanging out outside if the if people were at if 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 they happened at the cubs stadium if the game was actually there when they won you would have hordes of drunk people losing their minds mm -hmm. yeah it would have been nuts the crazy thing about uh wrigleyville was that if you got up at like four or five in the morning right at the crack of dawn and just walk down clark street you'd probably find a couple wallets money in them <laughs> from, <laughs> you know from personal drunk. experience <laughs> yeah absolutely i lived i lived off of uh off of clark and you've got what a couple thousand drunk people every yep. night just mm -hmm. partying and so you wake up there's money lying around and there's wallets just like on the Probably ground like iphones too at this point at this point yeah back then we didn't we I, I didn't uh when was i down there that was like 2008 or 9. so not a whole lot of iphones back then but mm -hmm. you know people had them no like you'd, I'd, you'd walk down the street and you'd you'd easily find five ten bucks in change if you were just walking down the street and then you go buy breakfast super easy way to live yeah. to be honest all right where are we at what is this? Uh, let's grab Damian Simmons says, well, I will be buying stock in Rumble now. Not financial advice. Just showing my support for Dan Bongino. Just got four more shares. GameStop this. Yeah, so I, I have shares in I bought shares in Rumble a little while ago because uh, I believe in the platform. Mm -hmm. But uh, I probably won't buy any more because I know the CEO and like and, and Tim Cast uses uh, Rumble affiliated companies and infrastructure. So, you know. I don't like stock trading stuff, and I would not want to besmirch my good name in the way Nancy Pelosi besmirches her bad name. <laughs> but uh, for everybody else, I would not make any recommendations other than to say I'm seeing a lot of people talk about how they want to buy Rumble stock. Rumble stock went down mm -hmm. uh, a little bit today, and it's like it's it's down from where it started. But that's that's always to be expected when a company uh, goes public. But uh, it's funny because according to the Motley Fool, Chris Pavlovsky, the CEO, is a billionaire. Wow, where, where uh, is I'm he like, is that on? true? So, based understand? on the amount of shares he have has and the value of the shares currently, his net worth should be just around a billion dollars. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. That's that crazy. Wild. Yeah, it is. But it's not like it means anything. Yeah, <laughs> what do really. you do with it? You can't sell it. Yeah. All right. Falcon Ledger says, Andy, do you believe Robert Silverman, who's done smears on you and Tim when he tweeted that he was just joking about being the leader of Brooklyn Antifa? Seems like a weird joke to be like, oh, I was just kidding. <laughs> it was a performance piece, I guess. I don't know who this person is. I, I don't recall commenting uh, about this individual. So mm. I don't. Uh, I think he writes for like the Daily Beast or something. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So research but it, you, get you, back to us. Yeah. All right. Where are we at? Danny Miller says, thanks for covering the shameful Canadian applause for a World War II veteran who fought against Russia. Oh, wait, wasn't Russia an ally in World War II? How times change. <laughs> yeah, isn't that crazy? Yeah, yeah. All, that's what I'm saying. They have no understanding of history, so they think modern-day standards apply in the sense that Russia is bad guy now, so he, they must have always been the bad guy. But that's not the case. Zachary, kids. Zachary Amnott says, Tim, I'm learning how to play guitar. I would love it. If you would put the chords to play your song, Will of the People. Uh, let me think. What are the chords that I do? I think it is, I think it's E alternating between uh, E and B. And then it goes down to G and G flat. So if you play E, G, G flat, or is, is, is it F sharp? F sharp is probably more accurate way of describing it. Yeah, F sharp. Yeah, if you're yeah depends on your... Uh, Depends on who you ask, I guess, but yeah, so yeah, E. Guitar, no, 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 it's not E, it's B. It's B, G, F sharp. There you go. Congratulations. There's other chords in the song, but that's the gist of it. That's like the verse. Yeah, I'm sure Carter could write some tabs up for that and put it online. Tabs. Yeah. Why I not? love tabs. I'm learning how to play bass with those tabs. They're tabs so are easy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hope you learn. Laura Spade says, I was already boycotting Burger King over the whole milk shark situation. I believe that was when they went on Twitter talking about milkshakes being against Andy No or something. Was that, was that Burger King or McDonald's? I don't recall either one of those oh, corporations commenting. I think, it, was, I think it might have been Burger King. Yeah, after, after the thing happened with milkshakes, there, there was a comment made by some like 
Burger King account? You want to look that up? I'm looking it up. Yeah, it was like when like Wendy's and Burger King were all trying to be like these meme accounts. <laughs> remember that? Remember Wendy's that? was yeah. the only yeah. good one though, you know? Right. Yep. Yeah, they were really good actually. Yeah. Corporate family friendly. How do you pull it off? I'm not finding anything right now, but I'll, I'll keep digging. Was it Burger King? Uh, it might have been know. Burger King. I don't think Laura Spade is wrong. Hmm. Jeremy Paul says, reach out to Chris from the To Be Better podcast. He would be a great addition to the culture war. He's smart and libertarian leaning. I say the best role model for young men in dating culture. Interesting. We'll take a look. Never heard of that. Red Rumax says, Colonel Kurtz today had one of Russell's lovers on her channel testifying he is a great guy. She was also begging you to have her on your channel regarding M. Manson. Marilyn Manson? Yeah, Marilyn Manson. So wait, someone dated Marilyn Manson and Russell Brand? They that's a, a crazy type. resume. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's... Oh, no, 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 no. It, 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 it didn't say that she was dating Marilyn Manson. I'm sorry about that. Sorry about that. That, that was incorrect. One of Russell's lovers and also wanted to talk about Marilyn Manson. Uh, is yeah. it fair to say that Russell Brand is the UK's Joe Rogan? Is that sort of like the level that they would be trying to go after hit on? I don't know. I, I, I mean, maybe the UK is substantially smaller. Right. Like proportional to the size of their media. Uh, Obviously, we're the more dominant media culture. and but, he's, but, he, but no, it's probably not. I mean, look, Joe Rogan, he can make a video where he's like, yo. I saw a dog. And then boom, headlines. Like Joe Rogan tells dog so story or everywhere. It's like, what? <laughs> Calm down, man. Yeah. I think it's funny when Joe Rogan has an opinion, it becomes major news and I'll see it like reported by everybody. And I'm like, jeez, man. Like Joe Rogan questions, you know, progressive tax being implemented in, in you know, Cook County. And then it's just like, what? Yeah. I see these stories pop up where it's just like whatever he, he makes an opinion. Because so many people mm -hmm. are listening to him. That's that's what I kind of wonder about with yep. Russell Brand. If people who don't consider themselves political listen to him and therefore he's even more dangerous because he has a wider reach than just one fringe political commentator. Mm. We'll grab some more Super Chats. The Risk says, first time Super Chatting, name the Halloween coffee Rise or Die with Roberto Jr. By the way, love Appalachian Nights and Rise with Roberto Jr. Sleepy Joe for decaf, rock on. We are launching Re-Rise with Roberto Jr. And uh, we've already, been, we've been working on our blend. So our signature blend, our signature coffees are, are always some kind of, you know, blend combination that we try to find the right flavor. And um, for Re-Rise with Roberto Jr., limited edition, it is a chicken foot bursting out of the grave. Because as much as we love Roberto Jr., we're also crass. But uh, that one, I think, is going to be out just in time for Halloween, hopefully. And I think we wanted to do an initial, we wanted we wanted to do only 500, but it's impossible. It has to be at least 5,000. Mm. So we're like, okay, well, we'll figure it out. Maybe maybe we'll be a single run of 5,000 for the season. And then when it's gone, it's gone. Um, just to circle back to the Burger King thing, oh, Jen Pisaki, uh, there, there was a tweet from Burger King after uh, a milkshake was thrown at Nigel Farage, I think. Oh, that's uh, what it was. And they got banned because they were saying like, this really? is a great idea. I, I can't find the tweet because it got banned, yeah. but it mm -hmm. was after Nigel Farage right. was thrown. The, the and, Burger and, King and, corporate account was like, you're right. totally right, being like, we're funny yeah. and we're very mm -hmm. good with the memes. And Farage was before you, right? Correct. Yeah. Because yeah. it was like they started doing this milkshaking thing and then with you, they got really violent. Yes. Beat me on that. So <laughs> I feel bad that during this this uh, um, super chat thing and there were questions directed at me and a lot of it is like, I don't remember, I don't recall that. And I, that might be part of the i mean it's one of probably the lingering um effects of the the uh subarachnoid um brain hemorrhage that mm -hmm. i wow. suffered yeah. in 2019 2019 was that beating people just think that i was just hit with like drinks but like something was, poor, but it was much more dangerous than that. well it was the the punches in in kicks to my body and bashes mm -hmm. to my head and eyes and face it was then after that that they threw all the liquids on it and i um, so I had traumatic brain injury and memory issues part of that. So yeah. apologize to any of the viewers out there who, you know, are hearing a lot of me like saying, I, I don't recall, I don't, I don't know what this is about. But yes, I do remember the Burger King UK account making light of what happened to N Nigel Farage. They, they yeah. tweeted May 18th of 2019, dear people of Scotland, we're selling milkshakes all weekend. Have fun, love, BK, hashtag just saying. And yeah, that wow. and that was right after <laughs> it happened. Yep. Let's grab more. Arthur Palmer says, the biggest problem with the media is that they so often scream wolf when there are none. No one will trust to cry until a wolf bites someone in half. Yeah. Joseph says, exception, Tim, not the rule. I know 18-year-old leftists and they are wonderful people just lied to constantly. Explain it with them. We aren't different. I never said you can't talk to the banality of communism. 
And you can explain to people and people wake up. In fact, I said the opposite. I said many people do wake up and they realize like, holy crap, what I was doing was wrong and I shouldn't mm-hmm. be party to this. My point is that if there is a group of people marching down the street, smashing windows, waving a communist flag organized by a group that's called revolutionary communism, and then you meet a guy who's in there and being like, well, I'm not. And it's like, OK, but listen, that's fine. I get that. But that's what I would refer to as the banality of evil. You are facilitating communists and their expansion and institutional capture. So your group, you are you are communists. It's like there's a dude. It's it, it, it just I don't know. I, I don't I don't see any other point to say it any, any other way. To, to get into the nitty gritty of like, well, it is it is Rev, Revcom. They are revolutionary communists, but some of the people who are working for them in support of communism don't actually know they're communists. So I won't call them that. It's like, well, that's confusing and hard to describe to people what's really going on. Mm-hmm. You know, I think there's this expectation from people on the right that we should be principled or holier than thou and not to adopt the left's tactics. But I think we should do away with that because as deranged as the left tactics are, they're effective. But I'm not even saying that. I'm it, saying the left is lying about people on the right being fascists because they are evil and the people on the right are calling them communists accurately. So it's more of the left using the Alinsky tactics, accuse your opponents of doing what you do. Isn't one of the tactics to label your opponents Nazis? Uh, yes, literally Probably. label them Nazis. Right. Attack them as fascists. Yeah, exactly. Attack them as fascists. So, so you, you will have a libertarian and a Trump supporter having an argument we, we, we will have two different conservatives in here arguing over the war in Ukraine. Like, you know, we had Ami Horowitz and Matt Gates having a, 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 a principled and heated discussion on the merits. And Matt Gates said, you sound like John McCain. And Ami was like, that sounds like a compliment. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like very different worldviews, but they're both fascists. Yep, Even though right. Matt's like no international war. It makes no sense. Fascism. Uh, that, that makes no sense. It's wild. None. Mm-hmm. But we'll, 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 we'll elaborate more. We'll, we'll get some more Super Chats in. Where are we at? All right. Grandstanding and hot dogging says if Russell Brand was trying to shield himself from his past behavior, he would not be building an anti-establishment audience. He would be acting like Howard Stern and catering to the woke mob. Keep up the great work, guys. Exactly. Howard Stern is a good example of someone who is scared of being me too'd. Mm. How many? How, <laughs> how, how much you want to bet? Yeah. Howard Stern. If there was anybody I had to make a guess, it would not be... I, if you put Russell Brand and Howard Stern in front of me and said, which one do you think is more likely to have abused women? I'm pointing to Howard Stern. I'm like, didn't he do it on <laughs> yeah. his show? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, d- didn't they have something like launching hot dogs at women's tits or something like that? I mean, they had so much stuff on that show, man. I don't know. I could be wrong. I want to be careful here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I'm just like. Maybe- I thought it was there was some conversation he was having with. Um, was it Hillary Duff or some like former young starlet that people years later were like oh wow wait a minute maybe this is not okay i mean if that's the first thing things things that surface what else has been buried and a lot of people who are in these positions you know instead of going to the media people who have allegations against them will go to them with a lawyer and they'll privately settle about it so we'll potentially never hear about these things because they've reached some some sort of agreement in in hopes of getting out ahead of it or keeping it from getting to the media yeah i mean like if 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 you look at Russell Brand, I just I just Google searched it and it's like a compilation of Howard Stern abusing women. And if you look at the stuff Russell Brand was doing, they accuse him of, it's like he's making crude jokes on TV that are like inappropriate. And it's like, wow, you know, those the people were laughing. They liked that dark comedy. You look at the stuff Howard Stern is doing, he's legitimately like saying things to these women that are just like Oh yeah, it's way, way different. Yeah. He's not joking. He's literally asking them about their bodies and stuff. <laughs> and they're getting uncomfortable and it's like not to mention the stuff he said about Columbine. Like, holy yeah, crap. Yeah. All right, everybody. If you haven't already, would you kindly smash that like button? Subscribe to this channel. Share the show with your friends. And head over to TimCast.com. We're going to have that uncensored members-only show coming up for you in about a minute or two. And, of course, we'll be taking your calls as members. So sign up for TimCast. Join the Discord because the members at TimCast.com are building culture and they would like to be friends with you, too. They do an after show. They do, a, they do a pre-show and an after-dark after-show, so definitely sign up. And as a, as a member in the Discord, you can submit questions and even call into the show. You can follow the show at Timcast IRL. You can follow me personally at Timcast. Patriot Jade, do you want to shout anything out? Yes. I got some alpha jerky here. It's good stuff. Tim knows it's good. Oh, absolutely. He was, he was eating it before it's the show. It's got no BS. Yeah, uh, it's just Obviously. meat, pepper. You can use the code BIG15. You'll get 15% off. 
Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Patriot J. I'm on Instagram as well. If you need legal services in the county of Los Angeles or greater areas, give me a holler. Uh, new music coming next year. Yeah, that's it. Thanks in- for having me. Ingredients, beef, pepper, salt. Look at that. So good. B- good. Big 15. That's right the on. code. There you go. And do you want to shout anything out? Yes. Uh, first, thank you, Tim. Um, you can follow me on X at Mr. Andy NGO, and my website is andy ngo.com. Please support my independent journalism. Thank you. Yeah, it's been fun having you both here. I love that you can do legal services and music. It's so great. And it's always nice to see you, Andy. Uh, I'm Hannah Claire Brimlow. I'm a writer for TimCast.com. Uh, you should follow at TimCast News on Twitter and Instagram. It's the best, in my opinion, although I am a fan of Post Millennial, of course. Uh, if you want to follow me personally, I'm on Twitter at uh, Hannah Claire. Or, no, I'm on Twitter at HC Brimlow, and I'm on Instagram at Hannah Claire.B. Thank you guys so much. And Serge is back. Yes, I am. It's good to be back. Uh, pleasure to meet you, Andy. I've been watching you for a while. We were talking about it before the show a little bit here. Likewise. Yeah. Nice. Pleasure and, to uh, meet you. Yeah, and also, pleasure to meet you as well. I've seen some of your stuff. Uh, Chris has talked about you in the past, I think, before. I don't remember where I'd seen Chris you Chris Berman is your number one fan. Uh, yeah. It's a Palmdale. Yeah, 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 man. Yeah, we got yeah. that Antelope Valley connection. Yeah. Love, yeah. Chris. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, I'm Surge.com on uh, X, etc. Uh, you know what I always say. Let's argue. It's fun. All right, everybody. Cheers. We will see you all over at TimCast.com in about a minute. Thanks for hanging out.